Regular meeting number five will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, Columbus City Council gathers in session this evening to address the needs of the citizens of the city of Columbus and to continue in their work on behalf of those citizens of our city. They humbly ask for your presence and assistance. The council members will use part of this meeting to consider as they do each year the reality of cardiovascular disease in the lives of the women of this community and will join in raising awareness to this as Red Day approaches during this week. All of us pray for the health and welfare of the women of our community and of all the citizens of Columbus, young and old. Help us to do all we can to encourage this awareness so that our women will not perish due to ignorance, lack of information, or lack of concern. We know, Lord, that human life is a precious gift. We pray that through your gracious presence among us, we will come to a new understanding of how we can improve our lives and our health so that this gift of life can serve you and our brothers and sisters with strength and vigor in support of our desire to enhance the health and happiness in the lives of all citizens, especially the women of our community. Amen. Harden Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, call the roll. Arden Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Any comments uh, or uh, resolutions from Council Members? Council Member Harden? Good evening. Thank you, uh, President Ginther. Uh, this evening, I'm excited uh, to be able to present a resolution uh, to Morpsey. And so I'll have uh, Mr. Uh, William Murdoch uh, and team come forward. Uh, tonight, I present a resolution uh, with President Pro Tem uh, Michelle Mills to the Middle Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Columbus 2020, and ULI Columbus. As a council, we are acutely aware of the impact transportation has on development. Whether that development is economic, quality of life, envir environmental, or sustainable, developing a thoughtful, deliberative, multimodal evolution of Central Ohio and Columbus transportation option is crucial towards maximizing our region's potential in the next 30 years. As Columbus continues to assert itself as the best place to live, work, and raise a family, we must be mindful of that urban infill and land redevelopment must coexist with the development of outer ring neighborhoods and our partners in the suburbs and exurbs um, that are members of Morpsey. The establishment of walkable neighborhoods with the availability of bike lanes and expanded public transportation options is absolutely crucial in making Columbus the vibrant and, and pulsating holistic community that we strive for it to be. As our population grows, as our dreams increase, and as Columbus people aspire to ever greater heights, it's our roads, it's our sidewalks, it's our buses, 
and maybe even one day, uh, just as streetcars carried Eddie Rickenbacker from East Livingston Avenue home, uh, to maybe streetcars will do the same, the next generation of heroines and heroes here in the city. So the Insight 2050 project is a great blueprint toward keeping Columbus moving forward in the right direction. So many thanks to uh, Morpsey, uh, uh, Will, and, for, and your team for pulling this together. Uh, it really does serve as a great blueprint for our city, and I think we are one of the first to uh, pull this, bring this resolution uh, before our council here in, in, in our, our area. So uh, with that, I would like to open it up for any, any other council, council member, uh, President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, Councilmember Harton. I am a happy co-sponsor of this um, because, as we try to say, we need to be pioneers and leaders in the region, and with great partners like Morphe and and the folks that um, that we hope to work with on the report, we will continue to be the pioneer and the leader in in our region, and and hope to lead the direction. I am very excited about the information that it will share with us as it relates to energy land consumption and transportation, some areas that I know are things that we have to work on, infrastructure costs and those things. As we grow as a city, then there are challenges that we must address and in order to be good stewards of our resources and to spend them intentionally, we need to understand what growing means and, and how that impacts our city as we operate, live and work. So I'm very excited about this and glad that this will be a good information um, leader and sort of helping us be more intentional with our funds. So thank you. Councilmember Paley. Um, as a member of the Board of Morpsey, I've watched you um, work on this and I'm thrilled with the results of it. And I want to thank Morpsey and their staff for all their hard work for this plan. Obviously, planning makes better building and so um, it's, it's an, a really good report and I enjoyed watching it grow and I and will enjoy watching it grow further. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch and staff. Ms. Murray, do you have any, any comments? Oh, sure, sure. Well, thank you, uh, members of Council, President Ginther, uh, for your support and encouragement on the Insight 2050 project, um, both as a long-term uh, Columbus resident of the university area and as the Morpsey director. Uh, I appreciate your leadership and uh, your pushing our organization to, to serve the city and its residents and businesses uh, better. I have with me my director of planning and environment, Kirsten Carr, who's the lead on the project. Um, and also uh, wanted to just point out that Insight 2050 is, is a phase one study about uh, Columbus region and how it's growing. Um, we're poised to add a half million people in this region, 300,000 new jobs, 300,000 new residences, and up to a billion square feet of redeveloped or new commercial or uh, non-residential space. And how our region plans for that and accommodates that growth uh, could affect our quality of life, it could affect the city's uh, uh, budget, it could affect uh, a number of uh, transportation and sustainability issues, and that's what Insight 2050 is about. And uh, as we uh, looked at that, we looked at uh, not only is our population growing, but it's changing. We're becoming older at the same time. Our young, younger population is growing. Um, people are demanding walkable environments, mixed-use environments, more amenities in their community, and this is at all income levels. And so Insight 2050 takes a look at accommodating those people and that growth and those different preferences on a number of different uh, potential ways to do that. How we grow affects uh, how uh, we look as a community and how our community thrives and grows. Uh, just one example from the report, and I think each of you have our, our executive summary. Um, we looked at a whole host of development and growth impacts, health impacts, uh, fiscal impacts, but, but one that stands out, uh, Councilwoman Mills, you mentioned uh, land consumption. Depending on how the region accommodates a half million more people, if we grow as we're currently planning in our region, that could uh, require an additional 270 square miles of agricultural land be converted to development. If we meet the market and meet the demographics uh, where we see that they're going, that could be not 270 but 45. And that 200 some square mile difference is the current footprint of the city of Columbus. So by 2050, we're talking about really big, impactful, almost stunning uh, numbers. On transportation, we're seeing the same thing. Currently, as a region, we, we travel 12 billion vehicle miles traveled every year. Uh, if we grow as we're currently planning, we'd need an additional 3 billion vehicle miles traveled worth of roads. If we accommodate that redevelopment, that uh, net impact could be 
uh, minimal and allow us to invest in other forms of transportation. So I could go on, but I'll let the study do that. Uh, certainly some, some good conversation to have. Our next step is to work with the city uh, and, and our uh, steering committee members, uh, our partners at uh, ULI Columbus and Columbus 2020 on more tools that could help uh, us accommodate this growth and help our communities, help Columbus uh, to uh, look at how to get in front of this as opposed to reacting to it. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, the leadership of uh, Councilman Hardin and Councilwoman Mills, as well as Councilwoman Paley as a member on Morpsey. Um, I should also get in a plug to thank uh, uh, Council for and the, uh, the administration for their support of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Uh, your leadership in the region is so critical to what we do. It means the world to the other 58 communities that we work with in Central Ohio. And uh, from staff members to council members, uh, your involvement and support makes, makes a big difference in the region. And uh, so we appreciate that. And with that, uh, thanks again for your uh, interest in Insight 2050. Thank you, Bill and Carson. I'll come present either resolution. Thank you. Oh, I apologize, Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, um, Councilmember Hardin. So, um, Bill, how will, if individuals want to get a copy of this report, how would they get this report? Uh, thanks uh, for the question, Councilwoman Tyson. The uh, report is available at getinsight2050.org. Uh, getinsight2050.org has all of the report and all of the information. Of course, they could call any one of us at Morpsey or stop us on the way out and we'll make sure they have that information. Thank you, and thank you for the report. And the last comment is just on the growth of people here, that 81% of our region's future household growth will be households without children. And that's looking at the millennials, but also the baby boomers. And it's, as you said, it's the highest um, numbers in any other previous generation. And so we have to begin to think about, you know, housing for seniors and uh, in a very different way. So thank you for the report. Well, well, thank you, and those are, uh, that is a critical point. The, the growth we're facing is different, and uh, our steering committee hopes to get ahead of that, so thank you. Any other comments from council members? With that, uh, can council president, I move for passage. Second. Arden Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Anything else, Councilmember Hart? That's it, President. No. Thank you. Councilmember Klein. President Pro Tem Mills. Councilmember Page. Councilmember Paley. Um, thank you, President Ginther. Tonight I just wanted to recognize, I know I'm a little bit behind on times here, but that January was Human Trafficking Month. And I wanted to highlight Grace Haven, which was founded in 2008 and working on a building, actually. It's a program that cares for sexually exploited children. Grace Haven provides comprehensive client-centered services to a wide variety of minors in Central Ohio. Human trafficking is something that we can combat, and I wanted to thank Grace Haven for their um, support in that area. If you want more information with regards to Grace Haven, you can call or 614-886-7011 or www.gracehaven.me. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Paley. Councilmember Tyson. Yes. President Ginther, I have a resolution, and I'm going to ask for Jennifer Sheely, the Executive Director of the American Heart Association, and Rachel Crowder, and anyone else who's representing the American Heart Association to come to the podium, please. And first of all, I want to thank all my council members for wearing red today um, in semblance of Wear Red Day, so thank you. And the resolution is 0037X-2015. It is to declare Fe February 6, 2015 as Wear, Wear Red Day in Columbus and to raise awareness of cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death among women. And whereas heart disease is the number one killer of women, yet 80% 80% of cardiac events can be prevented. And whereas cardiovascular diseases cause one in three women's death each year, killing approximately one woman every minute. 
whereas 90 percent of women have one or more risk factors for developing heart disease, yet only one in five women believe that heart disease is their greatest health threat. And whereas since 1984, more women than men have died each year from heart disease, and whereas women are less likely to call 911 for themselves when experiencing symptoms of a heart attack than if, they, than if someone else were having a heart attack. Whereas only 43% of African American women and 44% of Hispanic women know that heart disease is their greatest risk, health risk, compared with 60% of Caucasian women. And whereas women involved with the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women movement live healthier lives, nearly 90% have made at least one healthy behavior change. So now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus, this council does. Council recognizes the importance of the ongoing fight against heart disease and stroke and does hereby declare February 6 of 2015 as Wear Red Day in Columbus. Be it further resolved that this council urges Columbus residents to wear red in recognition of family, friends, and neighbors who have suffered from heart disease and also to, sh to show support for women and cardiovascular health. I move for passage. Second. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Rachel? Thank you, Councilman, Councilwoman Tyson, uh, Councilman President Gittner, and all members of Council. Um, as a dedicated volunteer of the American Heart Association's Young Professional Board, I am thrilled <laughs> to see that the Council is helping to call attention to the number one killer of women. Um, as you said, it does affect one in three women, and it is the number one killer of women. I've personally been affected by heart disease, so that's why I've gotten involved with the American Heart Association. Um, so I do have a family history of cardiovascular disease. Um, however, since the inception of Go Red, we have been collectively fighting the disease, and I'm proud to say that together we have saved the lives of 627,000 women. Um, so that's a pretty good figure there. Figure there. Um, the fight is far from over. There is still research to be done, um, still education to be done to fight cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, so I just want to offer my heartfelt appreciation to you, Councilwoman Tyson, and the entire council for your support in creating a visual display throughout Columbus to help the American Heart Association further their efforts in stopping the number one killer of women. Your support is truly invaluable, and we thank you. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I'd like to thank the entire council for wearing red uh, today in support of our mission and also for proclaiming Friday as Wear Red Day. Um, you know, health is the ticket to everything that we want in our lives, whether it's to spend more time with friends or more family. And by promoting this day, raising awareness, empowering women to take charge of their health, to know their numbers, to live their full life, we greatly appreciate the support and what you're doing for the city of Columbus. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if our viewing or listening audience want to get more information regarding Go, Go, Go Red or just more information around cardiovascular health, how can they contact you? Uh, they can visit our website at www.heart.org or certainly call our local office. We'd love to speak with them and help them live healthier lives. Thank you. Thank you. And then my only um, it's an announcement really is that February is designated as Black History Month, an annual celebration of achievements of African Americans and a time for recognizing the central role of African Americans in the United States history. The event evolved from Negro History Week, which was created by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, a Harvard-trained historian and a prominent minister named Jesse E. Moreland. Both men were founders of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. In 1926, sensing the need for more awareness regarding the history of people of African descent, Woodson and Moreland created Negro History Week. 
choosing the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. The event inspired schools and communities nationwide to organize local celebrations, establish history clubs, and host performances and lectures. Negro History Week eventually became Black History Month, and thanks in part to the Civil Rights Movement and a growing awareness of black identity. And in 1976, Gerald R. Ford officially recognized Black History Month, calling upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor their too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And allow me to provide you a, couple, a few historical facts regarding black history. So on today, February 2nd of 2009, Eric Holder became the first black attorney general. And also on this week, on February 3rd of 1870, the 15th Amendment of the Constitution granted African-American men the right to vote. I also want to mention that open enrollment for the Affordable Care Act will end February the 15th of 2015. And on the final day of open enrollment last year, over 15 million Americans who didn't have health insurance before the enactment of the law were able to get insurance. Overall, the uninsured rate has dropped from 18% to less than 14%. Although this is a big improvement, there are still more than 30 million Americans that are not covered. So as of January 16th of 2015, 7.1 million Americans have enrolled in a plan on, through the federal marketplace. To sign up for health insurance, please visit healthcare.gov for more information. And lastly, I'll just share that, Councilmember. Um, Paley, and she chairs the administration committee that the city of Columbus will have its 2015 Columbus Black History Month celebration, which will feature students, faculty, and staff at Fort Hayes High School, and they'll be highlighting and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Remarks will be, will be made by Mayor Michael B. Coleman, and the special guest will be Professor Sharon L. Davies, Executive Director of the Kerwin Institute. So please come out on this Saturday from the 7th from 2 to 4 to the King Arts Complex to celebrate the Black History Month celebration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson. <clears throat> Are there any uh, comments from our elected officials, uh, city auditor, city attorney? Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 239-2015. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 82, 227, 241, 243-2015. Technology Committee, Ordinances 159, 160, 198, 204, 224, 245-2015 and Administration Committee Ordinance 0186-2015. Following ordinances appear in our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of each into the record? Resolutions of Expression 39X35, X36, X and 40X-2015. Finance Committee Ordinance 115-2015, Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 162, 183, 187, 189, 190, 193, 195, and 231-2015, Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinance 248-2015, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 144, 207, 228, 232-2015, Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 98 and 135-2015, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 2626, 2637, 2925, 2969, 3007, 3008, 3015, 3018, 3023, 3027, 3028, 
3067 2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2016-2
0230-2015 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to enter into a contract with WBNS-TV to continue a public awareness campaign to address obesity in Central Ohio and to authorize an expenditure of $67,800 from the Health Special Revenue Fund and to weigh the provisions of competitive bidding and to declare an emergency. Um, the Commit to Be Fit program continues to be an excellent asset for the City of Columbus. In the past year, our efforts have concentrated on reaching residents with education and information on healthy foods, nutrition, physical activity, um, key, key activity resources in Columbus, and also topics such as the flu and immunizations and art walks and the, and the farmers markets and Let's Move events. And so with that, I would move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Tyson. Our next committee is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Councilmember Harden chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Uh, tonight in Public Service and Transportation Committee, we have Ordinance 2222-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Service to grant consent and propose cooperation uh, with the City of Westerville for FRA 710-3.21 Cleveland Avenue Schrock Road Improvement Project. Uh, with that first, I'd move uh, to amend as submitted by Clerk. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And if there are no further questions, I move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. And that is all we have for public service and transportation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Harden. Our next committee is the Recreation and Parks Committee. Council Member Page chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Tonight in Recreation and Parks Committee, we have Ordinance 75-2015 to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with Builderscape Incorporated for the Strawberry Farms Park Improvements Project to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate $1,652 within the Recreation and Parks Permanent Improvement Fund and to authorize the expenditure of $114,600 with a contingency of $10,400 for a total of $125,000 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Second. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Ordinance 247-2015 to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to accept two grants and enter into two agreements with the Columbus Foundation for Franklin Park Playground Improvements to authorize an appropriation of $55,000 to the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Second. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. Ordinance 251-2015 to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with McDaniels Construction Company for the Saunders Park Improvements 2015 project to authorize the expenditure of $1,859,000 with a contingency of $41,000 for a total of $1,900,000 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer $1,900,000 within the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund to amend the 2014 Capital Improvement Budget and to declare an emergency. I would like to ask Assistant Director Terry Lease to provide an update on the Saunders Park Improvements Project. Thank you, Councilmember Page, President Ginther, members of Council. Um, we are moving forward with this project. The anticipation is to place a cap on top of the uh, soil, the impacted soil that's already within the park. It'll be a two and a half foot cap. Um, we anticipate the work to begin this spring. Um, the seating and the grass should all be in place by the fall and then we hope to reopen the park next spring. Thank you. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Okay, sorry, Councilwoman Mills. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Page. I just had a couple questions just to re-inform the public in regards to this, that the cap was one of four strategies to use to address the issue, and this was the one that seemed to be the best fit, if I have that correctly. If you could update us in terms of the, the cap decision 
related for Saunders Park. Yes, President Ginther, Council Member Mills, and members of City Council, there were several options that re were presented to us by our contractor, Burgess and Nipel, and this was the one that provided the least amount of impact to the residents surrounding the park area because it didn't require any of the transportation of the impacted soil away from the site and was a way to just place a cap. Um, so it'll be a, a two-foot uh, cap that'll be placed on top of it. Of, of clean soil and then it'll be six inches of clean soil and turf that will then be placed on top of that. Um, it'll be something that we will monitor each year with the Ohio EPA. We will be required through that agreement, through the consent for no further action, to report to them on an annual basis to make sure that there aren't any erosion problems or anything else. And so this will also assure that years to come that no further action can take place on the site, no building of any structures, unless you would work with the Ohio EPA. So therefore, it ensures the integrity of the cap that we're placing on top. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, there's um, been the um, use of the park in terms of all the other activities have been moved to other locations, correct? Yes, it's, it is about a 12-acre park, and nine acres are what's impacted right now, and that's a lot of our soccer programs that have been moved to other parks, so we anticipate that those will come back in the spring of 2016, um, be able to use that park again. The southern tier of the park is where the pool is located. We did have that tested and found that there was no impact to the soils there, so that's been safe to use, and that pool reopened the latter part of this past summer and will be open and ready to go this summer. Thank you. Councilwoman Tyson. Thank you, um, Councilman Page. And just to add to that, I just want to make sure that our viewing and listening audience is aware that certainly Dr. Long, public health, has been very involved in Saunders Park and meeting with the residents and with, with the Ohio EPA. And there certainly is a plan through um, through Columbus Public Health to work with those neighbors whose yards have had been affected. So it's been kind of a two-prong approach. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I move for passage. Second. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you, President Ginther. That is all we have in Rex and Parks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Page. Our next committee is the Public Utilities Committee. Council Member Klein chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. First is 2679-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction <clears throat> contract with in situ form Technologies, Inc., for the 2014 annual lining project and to expend up to $4,511,118.04 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund. Uh, any questions or comments on the uh, annual sewer lining project? I move for passage. Hart and Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 2921-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with Strahlzer Paving Company for the Watershed Roadway Improvements Part 2 Hoover Reservoir Project in an amount up to $1,714,662.42 for the Division of Water to authorize a transfer and expenditure of up to $1,631,802.42 within the Waterworks Enlargement Voted Bond Fund to authorize an expenditure up to $82,860 within the Water Grant Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. Uh, Deputy Director O'Grady, could you Please uh, elaborate on what's being improved up at Hoover, <coughs> pardon me, up at Hoover Reservoir. Sure. Chairman Klein, <clears throat> Council President Ginther, members of Council. Um, this project is going to replace existing pavement at the Hoover Reservoir right along the dam crest, um, the adjacent parking lots, the adjoining driveways, and at the maintenance compound. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Director. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. Next is 30-31-2014 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to establish blanket purchase orders from a universal term contract for the rental of construction equipment with operator with <clears throat> Travco Construction, Inc. for the Division of Sewage and Drainage and the Division of Water and to authorize the expenditure of 
$2,120,000 from the <clears throat> sewage operating fund and $75,000 from the water operating fund. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Hart and Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. Next is 3070 2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to reimburse the Franklin County Engineer's Office for construction of a 24 inch water main along Fisher and Hague Avenue <clears throat> as part of Franklin County Road Improvement Project to authorize a transfer and expenditure of up to $1,320,000 from the Water Works Enlargement Voted <clears throat> Bonds Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. Any questions or comments on this reimbursement? Seeing none, I move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, <clears throat> Bailey, Tyson, President Kinther. Next is 31 2015. To authorize the Director of Public Utilities to establish a purchase order to make payments to Delaware County for sewer services provided for fiscal year 2015 and to authorize the expenditure of $2.8 million from the Sewage System Operating Fund. I move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And Council President, the last piece is 38 2015 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a planned modification to an existing professional engineering services agreement with Chester Engineers Ohio for the Jackson Pike wastewater treatment plant facilities and equipment upgrade for, Whitt <clears throat> for Whittier Street storm tanks project, <clears throat> pardon me, to transfer within $71,585 and expend up to $1,079,585 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Hart and Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. And that's all I have, Council President. Thank you, Council Member Klein. Our next committee is the Development Committee. President Pro Tem Mills chairs that committee. Madam Chair, floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Tonight in development, I have the following ordinances, several of which have direct impact on neighborhoods and some exciting directions um, that we are going, and I'm very proud to offer these for consideration. Uh, beginning with Ordinance 0208-2015, to adopt the University District Plan as a guide for development redevelopment and planning of future public improvements. The university district plan was initiated at the request of the university area commission and it addresses the territory contained within the commission's boundaries. Um, some highlights in terms of what this plan considers, it serves as a, a, a single source for land use and development policy, a guideline, um, a design guidelines for both commercial and residential development. The plan's guidance on density, parking, and related uh, development standards are intended to serve as a basis for the updates to the university planning overlay. Additionally, neighborhood mixed-use areas are considered at key codes and, and nodes and along the commercial corridor, such as Fifth Avenue and High Street north of Lane. The plan, the plan also focuses on denser mixed-use development on High Street south of Lane and Lane Avenue west of High while designating neighborhoods further from campus as lower density. I'm very excited to hear from the planning folks about the process, having several hundreds of folks engaged in this, um, replacing some of the um, existing documents, adding new guidelines, and having just a tremendous amount of engagement from the community on this plan has been to be commended. I'd like to offer the opportunity for us to hear from Doreen Uhau Sauer, President of University Area Commission, if you could please approach the podium. I'd also like to offer a Director Shoney some comments if he would like while we wait for Ms. Uhau Sauer to arrive at the podium. Mm -hmm. Director Shoney, have any comments? Uh, uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Uh, President Genther, <laughs> as team members of council and Chairwoman Mills, thank you very much for an opportunity to speak. You did an excellent job of summarizing a large plan, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to speak especially to the public process that went on with it. Uh, this is a plan that is largely um, the update of a plan that's been in effect for almost 20 years, since 1996, which was probably in 1996 the most extensive plan that the city had ever passed. Uh, calling for a university area review board and a number of other, I would think, 
innovative pieces at the time. Um, over the last 18 months, we have been uh, hard at work uh, with the revision, and I certainly want to recognize up front uh, the planning department, uh, Vince Papsidero, Kevin Wheeler, Dan Fertelman, uh, Mark Trevellis. Um, that to say that they were professional is, is an understatement. To say that they were patient is probably the best uh, accolade that I can give them. Um, in the end, what we had was uh, three public workshops, over 2,000 pieces of uh, feedback from the neighborhoods, 15 meetings with civic associations and smaller neighborhood groups. Um, we, uh, near the very end, we probably uh, accumulated another 40 pages of documents that spoke to the revisions of things. Um, and um, in addition to the 350 people who participated in three public workshops, which were very well publicized, and the, uh, the amount of material that we were able to distill, the uh, planning department was always at call to come out to every civic group, every subcommittee meeting, every small uh, question that came up to answer our questions and to proceed with it. So uh, in October, uh, the draft document uh, went to the planning committee of the university area uh, commission. It also went to the University Community Association. It went uh, in a special meeting to the University Area Review Board. Um, it has uh, passed the University Area Commission in December, and at that point went forward to Development Commission in January. And so uh, I feel like I do need to acknowledge uh, that we did uh, um, accumulate every document that we had ever passed before 1996. And when Laura Shin, who is no longer with the University Area Commission, but many of you know her is in California now, worked with Ohio State, every document that we found was scanned in and available for people to see. Uh, Jim uh, Bach has been our planning chair, who's helped to shepherd this through. And uh, just uh, Susan Keeney is our zoning chair. So this, this plan has been vetted. Um, and I have to say that uh, you might enjoy the fact that one of the most unusual documents we found, one of the older documents from the 1960s, uh, essentially called for a freeway between uh, Lane Avenue to connect with uh, I-71. And we quickly dismissed that one. We're not looking for the freeway. Um, what we do have now, though, is a shared vision by many diverse people of how to proceed. And we're looking forward to that directing development in the way that's most appropriate for both the city of Columbus and the people who reside there. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you for your leadership. And to use Vince Perpadero's words, this is a good plan, Council Member Mills. And uh, it great the work paper. and the engagement. Yes, and it, it did use a lot of paper. As the environment chair, I had to bring that up. We were talking about the several yeah. tons of paper. But um, it was good to have everything out and everyone to take a look at from where the, the area has gone into where it is now. And, and being the home of champions does require some changes, right? And so yeah. um, making sure that it's just not about the university but has a, a good good blend for the residents and so glad the mix of the commercial and the residential was really looked at in a new way than it had been mm -hmm. and just want to again as you have thought about thanking the planning department just great work and they're very proud of it and and felt that they did bring a good bit of, of patience and professionalism but what they were most proud of was the participation from the neighborhood and very glad to well, have the voices there. Believe me it was the planning department who were just excellent and I will convey your wishes back to the commission thank you so much for all of the support you give the university area. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to uh, make sure that there's note that it passed unanimously, which is um, great to hear. Director Shoney, have any comments? Uh, President Pro Tem Mills, President Ginther, members of council. Um, uh, I would start by echoing your um, thanks for the plan to our team at the planning department. I would start that way, but they've already had too many compliments tonight, and I don't want them to get. Um, too proud of themselves. Um, but more, I'd like to focus uh, my thanks to the Commission and to the members of the community uh, for the great amount of um, input that we had. The other comment that I would make is I think it's appropriate that we have this plan going tonight, the same night that you um, recognize the Insight 2050 report. Uh, that Insight 2050 report is fundamental to how we're looking at the city from a planning department 
uh, from a planning perspective right now. And um, it is something that as we go through this education process when we do plans, it's something that we're talking about the findings and, and the implications of that. And every plan that you see from us now will take that into account. So thank you. Thank you, Director Shoney. Just as uh, Councilmember Tyson brought up earlier, the consideration of where we have to look for housing and how that has been considered in this plan as the newer plans will have some of those inferences in there, which we're very glad to have. And the uh, folks at 2020 are looking at and helping us with trends along with Morsi so we can make those decisions. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 0255-2015 to authorize a director of the Department of Development to increase purchase orders with Albine, Albine LP, Ginkgo, Palumbo Law Group, LLC, and Looper, Nidenthal, and Logan for costs associated with tax foreclosure cases as a part of the Mayor's Vacant and Abandoned Properties Initiative to authorize the expenditure of $82,000 from the Development Taxable Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. Just a note, um, as for uh, the prosecutor's process, there were um, a selection um, for three law firms and there was a, a bid process that took place in result to that. Um, lowest and best bids for the service and certainly was is the authorization for this to enter into a contract with these firms through the Franklin County Resolution of 0246-2013. Um, want to make note that last year the city sold over 100 properties from our land bank. And the development department is continuing to reduce in blight through a variety of options as Moda own, becoming homeowners, people purchasing their side yards and things like that, um, and also developing new multi-family housing. It is certainly taking time to get a lot of changes through many of the neighborhoods, but we are certainly gaining ground and have been able to accomplish this through uh, a good bit of tenacity and creative solutions and working with a variety of levels of government. I believe we have one speaker on this ordinance, and that is Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, if you'll please approach the podium and share your first and last name, and you have three minutes to share with us your comments in support of this ordinance, 0255-2015. Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins, to Chairman Sully, vacant and abandoned property in North Linden there. First of all, let me just to state this once again. Um, yes, I am all for this. Um, three critical issues of this. When you talk tax foreclosure, what's the guidelines? What's the total amount where they not have to pay their taxes? Um, I'll just give you one address for a sample of 1060 of Peters Avenue. It, it stands now about $5,000, and it has been like this for several years. And again, the other issue, vacant property that's being torn down with side expansions of yards. Um, that is a good idea, but if we can put some other entity in this, like to rebuild what was on this vacant lots so we can stabilize the neighborhood. And again, I'm all for this, but my main concern is tax foreclosures. When you talk tax foreclosures, there's got to be a guideline what is the amount that's going to have to be seed over. Most vacant properties are annual taxes are like ten to fifteen thousand dollars have not been paid in two to three years. Those properties are still sitting in our community and still being blighted today, not being worked on this deteriorating year after year again. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, and I believe you raise a question that probably a lot of our residents ask when they find blighted or abandoned properties and they go on the website and find out who owns them and they look up taxes and then they call us a lot of times to say why can how can this happen so I'm going to ask director Shoney to offer some comments and if assistant uh, attorney Cox would like to offer comments as well director Shoney president pro tem Mills president Ginther um, I don't know off the top of my head if there's a specific dollar figure that we um, look at as a target for when we do um, a uh, expedited foreclosure on vacant and abandoned properties. 
Um, the, the process is that we have an interagency team that involves the Department of Development, uh, both our housing and code enforcement teams, as well as the city's land bank um, and uh, fire and police as necessary, looking at individual properties going through that list and prioritizing both based on the amount of the blight impact of a specific property as well as the reuse availability. Um, I, I'm looking at uh, Council Member Page to see if she might have anything to contribute to that from her prior um, experience, but uh, I believe that's the easiest summary for right now. I'm going to ask Assistant Attorney if you have any comments. And uh, President Pro Tem Mills, President <laughs> Ginther, uh, I would defer to uh, Council Member Page, yeah. who has actually done some of these cases. Uh, for her expertise on how those are handled. Okay. I'll, are there any other comments or questions that our fellow council members, such as Council Member Page, would like to offer? Thank you, President Pro Tem Mills, as well as Director Shoney and Attorney Cox. Um, I, um, as everyone has stated, I did work in this prior to joining council. And actually what happens is that the Franklin County, they look at the time that the taxes have been delinquent, and usually they wait about two years from the time that it's certified delinquent. And we work, we as a city, work with the county in order to um, point out those properties, as Director Shoney was saying, and then go forward and request that the county foreclose. And that is something that they are not necessarily looking at the amount of it, but the time that has passed since those taxes were paid. Also, if the property is vacant is one thing that they have to look at as well. I have nothing further. Thank you, Councilmember Page. I wanted to make sure I referred to you as Councilmember and not add you to the list of the other staff or cabinet members. <laughs> so thank you for your comments. And Mr. Wilkins, if you or other residents have questions regarding properties, please do not hesitate to contact the Department of Development related to vacant and abandoned properties. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 0256-2015 to authorize an appropriation of $9,128,365 in various divisions and object levels of the Community Development Block Grant Fund to provide funding for approved programs and to declare an emergency. I want to add that there's a process in regards to the CDBG funds, and we are um, not at the position of knowing exactly what those dollars are at this time, but the funds are through the Housing and Urban Development Community Development Block Grants that give Columbus the opportunity to tackle many of our unique but troubling community development issues throughout the city of Columbus. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. President Ginther, I'd like to move forward to the Environment Committee. In the Environment this evening, I have Ordinance 0225-2015 for consideration to authorize the Director of Public Service to apply for a 2015 Special Assistance Grant from the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and to execute a grant agreement providing for the acceptance and administration of said grant award on behalf of the City of Columbus Department of Public Service and to declare an emergency. If there are no comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And finally this evening, President Ginther, I'd like to move to rules and reference while I have the podium for an exciting piece of legislation for consideration. Tonight, I'd like to present a rules and reference 0114-2015, and I'm going to read this slowly so that I can ask Ava Johnson, Carl Chestain, and David Chambers, and others from the Task Force for the Greater Southeast Area Commission to please approach the podium. Just of note, um, to res this is um, a moment in time that I think many folks in this community is waiting for, including myself. It's just a great part of the city of Columbus, a great uh, a part of engagement, neighbors, um, community residents, businesses and the like have come together when it comes to tackling the challenges in this neighborhood and they take some creative approaches. They have fun doing it. They stay in constant contact with one another, uh, sharing strategies and thoughts, and there is just quite the input of inclusive 
approaches, and, I, and that's what I like about um, the group that is standing in front of you, that everyone has an idea and a different approach, and it's all welcomed, and everyone kind of listens and kind of see what's the best way um, to go at things. So I'm just very proud um, of the work here. Um, this uh, ordinance is to enact new section 3111.20 of the Columbus City Code in order to create the Greater Southeast Area Commission. Can I say that enough? Can we, Ms. Johnson? <laughs> to create <laughs> the Greater Southeast Area Commission. It has been a journey, um, and I have just enjoyed working with the folks on the task force and listening to how creatively they have addressed their concerns. Um, just to share a little bit, um, it's the moment I was appointed uh, to city council, this group invited me out and we were talking about trespassing then and were successful in passing trespassing. And they had a creative solution. Um, some of their businesses had a lot of uh, folks just loitering and hanging out and trespassing and not wanting. And they decided um, instead of reacting in a very aggressive way that they would play country music. And it worked. Um, and so again, just looking at some of their creative solutions, um, you didn't think I remembered that, right? And so then, and also in terms of litter pickup, they've had quite the engagement in their neighborhood. I, I can go on, but I won't because I know we all want to move on the agenda, but I'm just very happy for today. Again, Ordinance 0114 to enact new section 311.20 the Columbus City Code in order to create the Greater Southeast Area Commission. I said it one more time just for you. <laughs> I would like to share the, po the podium with Ms. Ava Johnson and all the folks from the Greater Southeast Area. <coughs> Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, President Pro Tem and Development Committee Chair Mills, uh, to Council President uh, Ginther, um, to Council Members Klein, Hardin, Page, Paley, and Tyson. On behalf of the Greater Southeast Area residents, we thank you wholeheartedly for your passage of Ordinance 0114-2015, which creates the Greater Southeast Area Commission. On this historic moment, as Southeast residents, we are both honored and humbled to become the 18th Area Commission of Columbus. Woohoo! <laughs> this mission was not accomplished by one person, but a team of individuals who are standing in back of me. They are all great community leaders in their own right. Our task force includes Carl Chastain and Diane Bunting from Walnut Heights, if you'll raise your hands when I call your names, David Chambers, Meadows at Winchester, Sandy and Les Essek, Mary Margaret and Ed Kipner, Gender Park Condos, and Mary Margaret and Ed could not be with us today. Nancy White, Cobblestone Condominiums, Nancy could not be with us today. And Wanda Brown from Country View, um, and myself, Wanda couldn't be here today, and myself, Ava Johnson, Kingston Crossing, Chattering Gardens, and Walnut Bluff. Our task force represents eight neighborhoods, but is supported by many, many more. As a commission, we will act as a liaison between neighborhood groups, property owners, residents, developers, and city officials. In addition to the task force, we appreciate the support of our families who stood beside us while we went on this journey. We also had an incredible extended family of individuals who helped us. We thank President Pro Tem and Development Ch Committee Chair Michelle Mills for helping to sponsor the legislation along with President Ginther. We thank Lynn LaCour, Far East Pride Center Manager, Department of Development, for her tireless efforts. We thank our community liaison officer, James Poole, for bringing us together. We also thank retired development city planner, Todd Singer, who mapped and crafted our boundaries. And we hope you will consider bringing Todd back on a part-time basis. <laughs> we could use him. We thank Jennifer Chamberlain and Summer Moynihan, two Far East Area Commissioners who, start, who shared their endless wisdom with us. We thank Michael Puckett, Department of Development, who first met with us as we started this journey and provided help along the way. We thank Stephen Dunbar, City Attorney, uh, Pfeiffer's Office, who reviewed our documents and made recommendations. We also thank um, Development Program Manager Paul Hatcher, City Clerk Angie Blevins, and all of you and your staff who have helped us complete this monumental task. We also thank the Southeast Community Coalition for the zoning work they've done over the years. We look forward to working with City Council as we put forth our best efforts to make sound zoning recommendations. In closing, we hope that you will uh, consider, advise, and assist us with the following. 
we need an area plan. One hasn't been done since 2000, and there have been significant changes in our area. We need help with traffic calming. There's endless traffic in parts of our communities which creates bottlenecks, accidents, and we just need some help with our traffic. We need economic revitalization. We've lost tons of businesses. And we also have problems with foreclosed and abandoned homes in our communities. We need more police officers and increased police presence. And finally, we need a recreation community center for our residents. Thank you again, and I'd like one or two of our members to briefly thank you also. I'd like to bring to the podium David Chambers and Carl Chastain. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Pro Tarn Mills and Council Councilmember President Gither and esteemed council members, uh, I just really, really wanted to say thank you. It, it has been uh, this, this has been a long mission. We've worked uh, a lot of late nights, a lot of weekend emails, uh, a lot of phone calls, um, but we, we definitely thank you for for your support. Um, just to get to this point, we're, we're able to stand here and say that. We're going to be a Southeast Area Commission. <laughs> so, and that's all that I have. <clears throat> President Ginther, President Pro Tem Mills, Council Member Klein, Harden, Page, Paley, and Tyson. This is an exciting day for those of us who have worked so hard to get to this point. And we want to thank each and every one of you and everybody that has helped us, especially Lynn LaCour, for your support. And again, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. And, and before I, I move for passage, I, I cannot resist but tell another story and a thank you to Officer Poole and Lynn LaCour, two champions and advocates on your behalf. And Officer Poole, uh, when Kalia came in to do the accreditation, for uh, safety at the time when I was safety chair and, and the, uh, the folks who were here doing the accreditation. At the end of the public engagement meeting, they said, we have one request. Uh, and they asked uh, <laughs> Safety Director Brown to please let them meet Officer Poole. They had heard they, they needed to meet who was Officer Poole because there were so many people in the audience that told, well, it's because Officer Poole and Officer Poole. And so the assessor said, can we please meet this Officer Poole? <laughs> So um, he is a, a great liaison, and you all have some, some real champions. And can I say enough about Lynn LaCour and her involvement and advocacy? And, and this is just really, as, as you all said, and, and have worked towards a great day like today to celebrate. And as you also mentioned, there are some other things we must continue to work on. Um, the recreation and the library, didn't forget that one, and employment access as it relates to economic development. We know we have a plan. Um, that we've launched in, in the near area, and we're going to work with you on, on what comes out of that plan. I know Director Shoney knows that I've asked about it almost every other week, um, but really, really want to work with the uh, level of engagement you have now going into the future so it continues to be the neighborhood that you love, work hard for, and have champions to work hard for. So with, without further ado, I'll offer comments or questions from my fellow council members. Council Member Paley. I want to thank the new Greater Southeast Area Commission <laughs> for its patience and respect with regards to the system. This is not an easy process, um, and you all worked really hard to get here. Um, as my, my comment for neighborhoods like you, you put the us into Columbus, and of course, I have to comment on Officer Poole also. I mean, those of you who don't know him need to. He was the first recipient for the Neighborhood Best Practices Police Liaison this year and was my um, liaison in my neighborhood. And he brings everybody together. Um, you're lucky to have him. Um, and, and welcome. We're happy to have you. Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Chairman Mills. I just want to say congratulations to 
um, you, and I know, um, Ava, you certainly have been working really hard on this, and I know each and every one of you have been. I remember seeing you at Barnett Recreation Center um, when we were having all of our meetings out in the community. Your whole team was there asking questions, getting advice as to how you move forward, and it really is wonderful to be able to see you stand here today, that you have, that you have now become the 18th Area Commission, and that hard work does pay off, and it's really great to see the diversity of, of your community community working together to make things happen. And lastly, I do have to say thank you to Lynn LaCour too. I saw her in the back and I know others have said thank you, but certainly she is just a tireless advocate for community. And um, so you have a great person to work with as you continue to move forward. And so thank you, congratulations. And Lynn, thanks for all the hard work you've done. Thank you. Council Member Harden. President Pro Tem, I, just, I would like to just join everyone in, in saying congratulations. Um, I think you guys were one of the first meetings that I took as a new council member and uh, to hear of the process that you guys went through uh, to, from the signatures gathering that you, you did. Um, I don't know if folks are aware of the, the work that goes into this, but you know, to think that this is really just the beginning that there is a lot of work that we'll, be, that, that we'll do together and that uh, opportunities for us to work together. I look forward to working with you and um, I'm with uh, Lynn LaCour, thank you. Uh, they were very, very appreciative and, and, and we heard that. And so uh, it's just an exciting, uh, exciting day. The moment we're waiting for, right? If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Okay. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President, Ginther. Lucky 18. <laughs> That's all I have this evening, President Ginther. Thank you, President Pro Tem Mills. Our final committee this evening is the Judiciary and Court Administration Committee. Councilmember Paley chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. In the Judiciary and Court Administration Committee this evening, we have ordinance number 0200-2015 to authorize the appropriation of $440,000 from the Electronic Alcohol Monitoring Fund to the Franklin County Municipal Court for funding of treatment services and to declare an emergency. The funds from the Electronic Alcohol Monitoring Fund are put to pay the cost of attendance of court-ordered treatment centers, thereby preserving the public health, peace, property, safety, and welfare of our community. If there are no comments or questions, I'll move for passage. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. That's all I have on the Judiciary and Court Administration, President Ginther. Thank you, uh, Council Member Paley. There's nothing else to come before Council this evening. Uh, we do have some non-agenda speakers, uh, and we will reconvene for zoning at 6.30. Nothing else to come before Council. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. We stand adjourned. Regular meeting number six will now come to order. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Second. Clerk, call the roll. Hart and Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. There are uh, any communications and reports received by the city clerk? No, there are not. Are there any first readings of 30-day legislation? No, there are none. We will now go to the zoning committee. I chair the zoning committee. All members serve on the committee. Uh, first, in the zoning committee this evening, we have uh, uh, 0236. Actually, before we get started here, uh, if there are uh, speakers uh, to speak on any pieces of legislation in the zoning committee this evening, would you please uh, stand? On the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variance, including staff, to please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. 
I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you all. First uh, up on the Zoning Committee agenda this evening is 0236-2015 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.035 R3 Residential District, 3312.09 Isle, 3312.25 Maneuvering, 3312.49 Minimum Numbers of Parking Spaces Required, 3332.13 R3 Area District Requirements, 3332.19 Fronting on a Public Street, 3332.26 Minimum Side Yard Permitted, and 3332.27 Rear Yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 71 East Como Avenue, 43214, to permit a rear single unit dwelling above a detached garage with reduced development standards on a lot developed with a single unit dwelling in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Richard and Janet Mendola, 4913 Vicksburg Lane, Hilliard, Ohio, 43026. The proposed use is to conform an existing rear single unit dwelling above a detached garage. The city department's recommendation is approval. Clintonville Area Commission recommendation is approval. We have uh, one uh, speaker slip on this this evening. Um, and it probably makes sense for us to ask for a uh, staff presentation, at least an overview on this piece of legislation. Ms. Pine. Good evening. The site is owned R3 residential district and developed with a single unit dwelling in a detached garage that was converted to a carriage dwelling without evidence of zoning clearance or a building permit. The requested council variance will allow two dwellings on one lot with no frontage on a public street for the rear dwelling. Variances for reduced maneuvering area and yard standards and a reduction of one required parking space are also included in the request. The site is located within the planning area of the Clintonville Neighborhood Plan, which recommends single unit residential development and should, uh, with existing densities as indicated on the land use and urban design plans. Staff believes that the continued use of this carriage house will not have a significant impact on the area's overall density, which is approximately 10 units to the acre, which is comparable with the residential densities uh, around this neighborhood. In consideration of the density and that the carriage house includes parking spaces, is already constructed and has been in use for years. Staff does not object to the request. Therefore, our recommendation is for approval. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Ms. Pine? Is the applicant uh, present this evening? Sir, would you like to uh, come forward and uh, make any presentation or statement. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we purchased this home, my wife and I, in March of 2012. It was a bank-owned property, and so at the time when we saw the unit, which included the uh, unit above the garage, we had no information uh, provided to us that it did not meet the zoning requirements. So. Once we became aware of that, we immediately then went through the process uh, to present it to the Clintonville Area Zoning Commission. And uh, as you heard, that was approved and then to the uh, Clintonville Area uh, Commission. So we, you know, we went through the steps as was indicated. It's uh, as far as we can tell from the information that we went back to, it's been, been in continuous use since at least 2005, but probably earlier than that because of the riders that were attached to mortgages indicating uh, that it was recognized to have more than one unit on the property. So we did not do any changes. It was already in use and that's why we've you know, gone through the process of applying for the, the variance. I should have asked you just to make sure I was clear. You are Mr. Uh, I'm Richard Mendola. Okay, thank yes. you, sir. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure <laughs> that we were clear on that. Um, Okay, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, give a rebuttal after we hear uh, from the speaker. Any questions for Mr. Ndola before we take the speaker? Thank you, sir. Thank you. We only have one speaker on this uh, legislation this evening, and that is Elizabeth Weatherholt. Ms. 
Weatherholt. Welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd share name, address, any organizations you represent, you have three minutes to speak against this uh, variance. Thank you. I uh, am uh, Elizabeth Weatherholt, I'm also known as Libby, and I am the uh, District uh, 3 Commissioner from the Clintonville Area Commission, and I was the lone dissenting vote on whether or not to approve this. And first of all, um, the zip code should be 43202, not 14. And um, I uh, think it's inappropriate to approve this um, uh, uh, ordinance because um, whether you know whether or not the the current owners knew anything or not, this residence, uh, the second residence, was established without any variance and therefore is illegal. Um, I think the lot is very small and inappropriate for a second um, residence in this neighborhood, and. Um, uh, the new owners um, claim, have, have claimed that they didn't know anything, but they do own over 30 rental properties all over the city of Columbus, and therefore I think uh, ignorance of zoning is, is really not an excuse on this. If they were perhaps first-time homeowners or something, I might excuse them on this, but they do rent many, many properties all over the city of Columbus, and this is why I voted against it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Any uh, uh, questions or comments from Ms. Weatherholt? For the applicant or for the commissioner? Okay. Mr. Uh, Mendola, would you uh, mind coming back to the, the podium? Um, if there's anything else you'd like to add on a rebuttal, and I know President Pro Tem Mills has a question for you is as well, but if you'd like to offer a response or a rebuttal, uh, this is your opportunity to do that, sir. Okay. Uh, just to reaffirm what, uh, what she mentioned, she was the lone um, dissenting vote for the committee that voted. Um, and in terms of, you know, the indication, uh, yes, if we had looked into it, we could have discovered that, but this is the first property of this kind that we have purchased. and. Uh, so we didn't have any thought, the thought never came to our mind that the uh, property would not have had the correct variance to it. Thank you, sir. Uh, President Pro Tem Mills? I think you did answer my question. So you, to um, confer, affirm what the speaker stated that you do own several properties? Yes, and we've never had another zoning issue or, or problem with them. This is your first time through this process? Yes. Any of your properties? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions uh, for Mr. Mendel? Council Member Tyson. Thank you. Um, so your other properties, are they single units? Are they all single units? There's um, a building that has uh, four units in it. They're not, it's not like separate. None of them have a detached garage that has a, a unit to it. That's what I was referring to. We do have some uh, properties that have a uh, building that has multiple units in it. Yeah. And so you have other properties, I'm sorry, did you say that have garages with units above no, them? No, no we have don't. no other property like this one. We do have other properties that have a building with multiple units in it, but it's not with a detached garage. Okay. So you just made the assumption that because that was there, that it was probably already zoned appropriately. Is that what uh, you did? That's correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Mandola? Thank you uh, Thank very you. much. Any other questions, uh, comments from council members? If not, I uh, move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Hart and Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 0240-2015 to grant a variance from the provisions of section 3367.01 M2 manufacturing uses of the Columbus City Codes for the property located 6950 Americana Parkway 43068 to permit up to 6,600 square feet of child daycare space and up to 
3,291 square feet for a personal training business in the M2 Manufacturing District and to repeal Ordinance 1615-2015 passed on July 30th, 2012. The applicant is John D. Weimer, uh, care of Holly Hedden, agent 6950 Maricana Parkway, Reynoldsburg, Ohio 43068. The proposed use is a personal training business and child daycare center. The city department's recommendation is approval. Far East Area Commission recommended approval. Any questions uh, or comments regarding this legislation? I think we've uh, noticed a couple of typographical uh, errors, so I'd make a, mo a motion to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President, get there. Amended. Now move for passage. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to request to amend to emergency. Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President, get there. Amended to emergency, and finally move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President, Ginther. Passed. Next is 0253-2015 to rezone 345 East Deschel Avenue, 43206, being 6.16 plus or minus acres located at the southeast corner of East Deschler Avenue and Brook Street from R2F Residential District to AR1 Apartment Residential and R3 Residential Districts. The applicant is CHP Casto Barrett School Enterprises LLC, care of David Perry, David Perry Company Incorporated, 145 East Rich Street, third floor, Columbus, Ohio, 43215, and Donald Plank, attorney, Plank Law Firm, 145 East Rich Street, third floor, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is multi and single unit residential development. City Department's recommendation is approval. Columbus Southside Area Commission recommended approval. Historic Resources Commission recommended approval. The Development Commission recommended approval. Uh, at this point, I'd ask for staff presentation. Good evening. The site is developed with the formal Barrett Middle School in the R2F Residential District. The requested AR1 Apartment Residential District will allow the development of a multi-unit residential development on 3.49 acres, and the R3 Residential District will allow the development of single-unit dwellings on the remaining 2.67 acres of the site. Companion Ordinance Number 0254-2015 is also requested to vary setback, yard, height, and landscaping and screening standards and includes commitment to a site plan for conversion of the former school into a 53-unit 53 apartment building with five additional apartment buildings in the AR1 district and 22 single-unit lots in the R3 district. The site is located within the planning area of the South Side Plan, which recommends institutional uses for this location in recognition of the site's previous use as a school. The plan includes guidelines for the potential redevelopment of these sites to ensure they are compatible with the surrounding land use, density, and design. Staff recognizes that the proposal is compatible in terms of land use and design with the concurrent variance request. The proposed density of the school building and additional apartment buildings is higher than the surrounding, neighbor, sur surrounding neighborhood, but is offset, offset by the adaptive reuse of the historic school building and development of single unit dwellings. Therefore, the staff recommendation is for approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff before we uh, hear from the applicant? Mr. Perry? Thank you, President Ginther and all members of council. My name is Dave Perry. I'm here uh, as the uh, agent for the applicant on this rezoning. Um, I don't uh, have anything to add to the staff presentation at this time, but would be glad to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. Any questions for the applicant at this time? We'll go ahead and take our uh, speakers uh, and then offer 
the applicant an opportunity for a rebuttal if they so choose. Our first speaker is uh, Bob Lichty. Mr. Lichty, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to the podium and share name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you've signed up to speak in support of this this evening. Yes. Good evening, uh, President Ginter, uh, President Pro Tem Mills, other folks on Council. Um, Bob Lichty, 1280 South 4th Street in Marion Village. Uh, this project's in Marion Village. I'm Executive Director of the Parsons Avenue Merchant Association and been doing community work in uh, South Columbus for about 24 years now. Um, this is a very uh, important and a somewhat controversial project. It's on an important site. This is the site of the first South High School. And uh, when Columbus was having a lot of industrial growth, um, they decided to build the new South High School, which is the current one, and this became uh, Barrett Middle School, named after Charles, Charles Barrett, the first principal there. Um, I was involved with a number of the neighborhood folks to get this building on the Columbus Historic Registry because we were in great fear of it being torn down. Uh, it is great to get to this point where it looks like it, it will hopefully be uh, renovated and reused. Um, when Homeport and uh, that later Casto, uh, you know, came to us, there's been uh, you know over a year of uh, of lively debate, you know, about this. Again, it's an important site. It's six acres, one block off of Parsons, and it's it's a it's a major project. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and concern about the density, and uh, to uh, the developers' credit, they made significant changes. There was concern about uh, that I know I had and some other folks about there were no single-family homes at all. There are now 22 in this plan. Um, I personally feel that uh, at this point, uh, this is going to be a very good development for Marion Village for South Columbus. Uh, I think it is critical on this because there's some very good people in this room who are uh, opposed to this project and some people aren't in the room. And I think it's critical that we keep a dialogue going with the developer during construction and after construction as, as this continues. Uh, but uh, I do think that uh, I commend uh, Homeport and Casto for reaching out and for all the community meetings. And uh, I think this will be a, a good addition uh, to Columbus. And in particular, it, uh, it gives us an opportunity with the new library coming in a, a block away uh, to help, you know, uh, clean up and redevelop that part of uh, Parsons Corridor. So, thank you. Any uh, questions for Mr. Lichty? Thank you, Mr. Lichty, for coming down tonight and sharing your thoughts on this. We have uh, three speakers that have signed up uh, to speak against this variance this evening. Uh, our first speaker and you're going to have to forgive me and correct me. Is it uh, Mr. John Marshloff? Did I pronounce that correctly? Well, thank you. Just wanted to make sure I didn't butcher it uh, as you made your way up here. Mr. Marshloff, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to the front, share your name, address, any organizations you represent. You have three minutes, sir. My name is John Marshloff. Um, I represent Barrett neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen of the Columbus City Council, I thank you for serving our city. My name is John Marsliff. I was born and raised in Columbus, and I have lived in Columbus my entire life, except for 10 years when I served in the United States Marine Corps during the Vietnam War era. My wife, Diana, and I own our home at 369 East Stewart Avenue and have lived there for over 28 years. East Stewart Avenue, like many other streets in our neighborhood, is a jewel, a beautiful, quiet, tree-lined, brick-paved residential street of century-old homes and located immediately east of beautiful, historic Schiller Park. I'm here to tell you how this Barrett School property redevelopment plan will negatively affect our lives. The mass density of this 108-unit all-rental plan is unprecedented for any established residential neighborhood. To permit a developer to shoehorn this kind of rental density into a four-acre tract in the midst of our beautiful neighborhood is untenable. As is, this redevelopment plan in our midst stands to wreak havoc on our neighborhood as follows. Number one, 
As is, this plan will bring in a large number of short-term rent rental residents using the developer's own advertised expected turnover rate of 50% annually. That equals 54 inbound and outbound moves a year, or nine moving truck operations a month. Number two, as is, this plan will require homeowners to do double duty for the day-to-day, day-in-and-day-out neighborhood maintenance, shoveling snow, picking up litter and dog droppings, reporting cars parked on the streets for months, and so forth. From experience, we know most folks who rent do not take stewardship of the neighborhoods in which they live. Number three, as is, this plan will serve only to compound the high crime rate which we experience now. Our current crime rate is deplorable, and nearly all crimes against our properties are committed by persons who live adjacent to our neighborhood. High-density rental units will entice criminal interlopers to visit our neighborhood more frequently. Number four, as is, this plan will compromise access to our existing off-street parking. Parking is a huge issue to us who live in the neighborhood now. How many more vehicles will 108 rental units bring? Although city code requires one and a half parking spaces per unit, I've never known a property owner anywhere sufficiently serviced by a half parking space. Recently, Diane and I walked our entire street to poll our neighbors about this plan. Several others who own properties on adjacent streets bordering the Barrett site did the same. The overwhelming majority of neighbors we contacted agreed to sign a petition asking City Council to amend this plan <clears throat> and have the petitions, and I have the petitions here for you to view. In conclusion, I have one more paragraph. We should decide what happened, who should decide what happens to our property values in our futures. Should it be a landlord seeking to build a high-density income-producing project without the input of the surrounding hard-working homeowners, folks who have faithfully paid property taxes in the city for decades and decades? Columbus City Council is the decider. We, the petitioners, ask you to do the right thing. We ask you to take the responsibility and investigate this plan further. Thank you very much. Mr. Marsloff, whatever you might have to share with council tonight, I'll ask Mr. Paul uh, to come down and get a copy of that. We'll make sure all the council members have that. Any questions uh, for Mr. Marsloff from council members? Council Member Klein. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Mr. Marsloff, what are your thoughts on the, is it 22 units, homes? 22, the 22 Residential we, were, we were initially pleasantly pleased with that modification to the original plan. The original plan was to cover the entire acreage with high-density rental units. Uh, we object to the rentals vehemently. Um, we don't feel that 22 residential lots in that close proximity to this large re rental development is viable. They are predicting these properties may sell in the area of $300,000 I would not be one of those investors living right next door to a, a complex like that. Thank you. A question, President Pro Tem Mills? Yeah, and your um, concerns related to rental property, are there in the vicinity any other rental properties that you're aware of? Or is it the density of the rental property, just so that I understand your concern? It's, it's the density. We, have, uh, we, we enjoy the diversity of our neighborhood for all kinds of properties, and it works out very well. The problem is that there are a, a number of rental residents who don't do their share. Uh, it's the property owners that are the backbone of taking care of our neighborhood. Um, we feel that we would be highly outnumbered by having a, a large complex like that of 108 units. Any other uh, questions for Mr. Marshall? Thank you, sir, for coming down tonight Thank and you uh, appreciate you sharing that information with Mr. Paul as well. We'll make sure that's part of the record. Our next uh, speaker who's uh, opposed this evening is uh, Mark Greiner. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Mr. Greiner, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to uh, 
podium and share name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you have three minutes. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you do on our behalf. Uh, I'm Mark Greiner. I live at 326 East Daishler Avenue. I live right across from Barrett. I've been almost 30 years, went to school there, just like my dad did and his grandfather back when he was in high school back in the day. And I'm going to kind of maybe deal with the why I'm opposed to it as opposed to some of the what's of it. You know, I've, I've been there 30 years. I've seen my neighborhood slowly, consistently getting better, people coming in, buying a house, renovating it just slowly, kind of under the radar, and you know, it's a nice neighborhood. And growing up in there, I feel a little bit like it's a small town to me. If I go a few doors away, it's a lady who babysat me 50 years ago. Give the other way is families that I went to school with. And this makes me deal with this more from a perspective, what does this do to the fabric of our society? You know, everybody's busy, we don't get to know our neighbors, and how would you like to take your immediate block and have your density all of a sudden triple and have it be mostly rentals, people that you don't know, they're going to kind of come and go, how would that affect your quality of life? You know, and I'm not bashing renters in any sense of the word. I have three kids that are grown, I'm sure they're great renters, but they're not going to have the same investment in the neighborhood as somebody that you've known for two years or five years or 20 years. And, you know, so if I go back to the density of this, that, I think, tears at our fabric. If you've got a 50% turnover, that tears the fabric of your neighborhood. And then if you get these variances for parking, which makes it harder, my wife parks farther away, it's not as safe, uh, it's just, you know, not as pleasant an area to be in, and then you've got the renters who are there, but they can't find a parking space, they don't have green space, they're going to move out. This is going to exasperate that, that problem on there. So what I really would like you to do is just leave the protective measures that you already have in place and do us, do us no harm. You know, I don't think, if you think about it, you would want that done in your neighborhood, and hopefully you'll protect us, uh, because, you know, once the development's done, the developers have taken their profits, they've gone elsewhere, nothing wrong with profits, but this damage is just something that's going to go on decade after decade indefinitely, because people are just going to come in and out, and our neighborhood will never really be the same, and we have a, we have a jewel here now. So hopefully uh, you'll, you'll see it this way. Thank you for your time. Questions? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Greiner. Any questions for Mr. Greiner this evening? Thank you, sir, for coming down this evening and um, sharing your thoughts on this proposal. And our final speaker opposed to this this evening is Scott Zipburn. Brooks, Burtz. Leave it to me to mess up the easy one, right? What's your last name, sir? Burns. B-U? B-U-R-N-S, Burns. Burns, very easy. Mr. Burns, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd share name, address, any organizations uh, you were upset, sir, you have three minutes. All right. My name is Scott Burns. I live on 285 Thurman Avenue. Uh, I've been a resident there for about one year. We've rehabbed a house, and we love being in that neighborhood. I want to thank you, Mr. President Ginther, and members of the council for hearing us tonight. Um, I'm against it. I am for the creative use, uh, utilization of Barrett School, but I'm against it as it stands. Uh, my reasoning not being for the 22 single-family units that we have, but particularly the high-density apartments that would come at the end of the school. We're already a parking impoverished neighborhood. Uh, we have several very famous restaurants, uh, including Thurman Burger, right down the street, and parking stretches from those places down both directions quite a way. So we are missing parking as it stands. So high density apartments would really, really challenge that, uh, number one. Number two, um, I really feel that as a resident there, um, many of the residents, we don't know what's going on. Outside of a few pieces of paper usually cir circulated by some other residents in the know, um, we don't know that this is happening. Um, I didn't know about tonight's meeting until I happened to talk to a neighbor tonight. And so I think really the representation of our neighborhood that's really trying to invest in the area and fighting crime and those kind of things, they are largely in the dark often on the continual developments of this. And if they understood the implications that it would be upon our parking uh, alone, they would really be concerned and would like to have a voice in that. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. I love my neighborhood. I love being there. I also love my neighbors being able to park. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burns. Any uh, follow-up questions for Mr. Burns? Councilmember Klein. Thanks for coming down. Uh, there's no 
parking variances in the request so you just uh, is your concern about parking just a con conceptual concern because the applicant itself satisfies the code requirements okay so as I understand there's a hundred and eight uh, uh, rental units being put in that one lot there mm -hmm. and um, so yes I've, I've not been privy to how all this works in and out but um, I our streets are already full so unless these could actually contain all the parking spots within the facility there um, I'm just I'm, I'm looking at as we all fight for parking spots every sure, night I, yeah and I look parking's a big deal in a lot of areas of town want to respect those concerns so I'm curious to see what the applicant has to say about parking because I, I I've heard a general theme of the speakers of uh, the concern of overflow overflow parking onto the street to just see what your plan is, if there is one. Because I noticed there's no parking variance in, in the request to see if uh, the city code um, currently meets the expectations of the parking for the applicant. But thank you, I appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Burns? Thank you, sir, for coming down this evening. We appreciate it. So should we hear from uh, city staff first about parking before we ask for uh, a rebuttal? Um, first off, this is the zoning ordinance. It's only for the establishment of the AR1 and R3 resi resi uh, residential district. We will be discussing the uh, council variance ordinance, which does include a number of variances, but none of them are for the number of parking spaces. Any other questions for uh, city staff before uh, the rebuttal? President Pro Tem Mills. Could you provide a little bit more of layman's terms on what that means? I think what I'm hearing from some of the folks who are not sure of how or where this works. So if you could do just a little bit more on layman's terms, I'd appreciate it. On Absolutely. what's in front of us versus what's coming up. Absolutely. Um, this proposal is to rezone from R2F to the AR1 apartment residential and R3 residential districts. And um, the site plan that is committed to is to the council variants. Um, what the establishment of these zoning districts means is that somebody could submit uh, permits for multifamily or single family in each of those districts. Um, the next ordinance that will we'll, that you'll be considering this evening uh, allows them to develop it in accordance with the site plan that they have proposed. Okay, uh, rebuttal from the applicant, Mr. Perry. Yes, thank you, members of council. The rezoning and variance applications were submitted in early September 2014 after many months of outreach by Homeport and Casto uh, with community meetings. There were three, uh, three major public hearings on the application. Um, that The third meeting occurred in August of 2014 and is largely represented, the plan presented at that meeting is largely represented by the plan before you tonight. There's been some minor changes since that time. Um, that August plan presentation was overwhelmingly welcomed and and encouraged to proceed at that uh, community meeting in August 2014. We proceeded with filing the, the zoning and variance application and have proceeded through numerous steps with Marion Village, Columbus Southside Area Commission Zoning Committee, Columbus Southside Area Commission, Historic Resources Commission, Development Commission, all with approval recommendations, and then now before you tonight. This is a $25 million development project on a school site that the, uh, the Board of Education has closed the school and no longer wants to own. Uh, that, stepping back from the details for a moment, is, is a wow moment to me. A $25 million construction project in Marion Village. Marion Village has arrived, that's, that's fantastic. Um, there, there was a, a suggestion about, um, or there was a question about the, the quality of the product. 22 single family homes, $300,000 plus or minus estimated on the price of them, 1,800 to 2,000 square feet. Um, the apartments are, uh, they, they vary in size, but I'll give you the, the, the range estimate is uh, $900 a month to almost $1,600 a month on the rents. 
Uh, we're talking granite countertops, um, uh, hardwood floors, up, upgraded cabinets. Um, this is a great project. This is, this, this is um, we believe this will be an amenity to the neighborhood. On the density issue, um, if one density is, is typically calculated on the density of the project rather than segmenting segments of the project, and the, the density on this project, single family and multifamily, is approximately 20 units per acre. That, that is, that's, a, that's very much in line with urban development. Um, this council has approved many projects, many of the urban redevelopment projects that are underway now at that density and much higher. Um, let me give you an example because sometimes density gets, gets lost in the form. Um, a a two-family dwelling on a 4,000 square foot lot, which is a very normal midtown area size lot, is 21 units per acre when you extrapolate that to, to acres and, and number of units. So this, this density is not unusual for an urban environment. On parking, um, uh, Ms. Pine is correct in that the ordinance immediately before you is to establish the AR1 and R3 zoning. There is a variance ordinance that follows this that grants um, a number of variances, but none of them are parking. We, we fully comply with the city code and in fact, the community process prior to even filing the application, the message was loud and clear. Uh, we will not support any parking variance. And the project has been designed to, to fully comply with the one and a half spaces per unit. Um, is on-street parking tight? Yes, that's why, that's why we're complying with the code. Um, is on-site parking of all the other residential properties in the area fully utilized? It is not. Uh, I have driven the alleys in this area. There are properties that are fenced to the alley where there can be no access for, for vehicles to the property. There are garages that, that um, clearly are not being used for parking cars um, and so on. So um, I think it's just human nature. Um, you, you hear this frequently about midtown area projects about parking, but I think it's just human nature that people want to pull up in front of their house and park, park right in front of their door or very close to it. And, and I, I believe that's the issue. Um, it is, it is not, um, uh, it, it's not a parking issue because of our project with, uh, without having a parking variance and therefore complying with the city code, so. Any other uh, questions uh, for the uh, applicant, Council Member Tyson? Yes, and I understand there's no parking variance. I just want to be clear, is there parking on, you know, this, this new development that you're creating is there parking in that development? Yes, Councilwoman. Um, the multifamily fully complies on site with a combination of attached garages and surface parking. It is fully self contained to the city code requirements on the multifamily area. We are not counting anything on street or in any off site lot anywhere. The single family, the single family fully, fully, will fully comply. Um, part of the project is building an alley that will provide access to most of the lots. We anticipate at that price level that those homeowners will, want, will all want two car garages and therefore they will have their two parking spaces. In fact, um, getting a little ahead to the variance ordinance, one, one of the variances is to shift the garage, detached garage side yard slightly to create the ability to have a third surface parking space at, at each of the single family dwellings. So uh, to answer your question, all parking is met on site. Thank you. Thank you. I skipped a step in here. We have a representative from the area commission that is present. And I should have asked uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Davis if he wanted to, to speak to the legislation this evening before I asked for the rebuttal. So my apologies, uh, Commissioner Davis. Quite okay. Um, I'm Curtis Davis. I'm the zoning chair and vice chair of the area commission. Uh, as you've heard tonight, uh, this project has been uh, like a 14, 15 month project. Uh, there was multiple uh, meetings with uh, the developers. They explained uh, what they wanted to do. Uh, the other thing that happened is uh, the neighborhood came back and had an issue with uh, high density on the uh, residential properties. They came back and agreed to do the uh, 22 um, single family homes. Um, they also uh, reduced the, the apartments uh, in a historical thing uh, that reduced it by one or two apartments. 
when you did the historical thing, so they asked, so it kind of reduced it down some more. Um, they've been very forthright with us um, on you know, what they were wanting to do. Um, both Casto and Homeport, uh, both have been in business 30 plus years. Uh, I've got a good reputation uh, within the community to take care of the properties. Uh, and the commission felt that uh, this was a, a good asset and a good uh, project for the South Side. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Any uh, questions for the commissioner? Thank you very much for being here tonight and, and sharing your thoughts. Any other questions or comments, uh, discussion? President Pro Tem Mills. My question is for the applicant. Uh, can you share a little bit about some of the current concerns I've heard from some of the residents are about the operation, the care of the property because of the status of the property and the density and things like that, the responsibility of managing the property and how will that be resolved and to continue working with the community. And Commissioner Davis talked about some process that involved engagement that then led to some changes. Are there any other changes or things you want to share that in this process started off one way that maybe to accommodate some of the desires or concerns of the residents? In addition to that, readdress the parking concern by numbers. So I think that helps the understanding of the availability of the of the parking within the development versus what would be spillage onto the uh, public streets. Um, okay, the the change that um, Commissioner Davis referred to was um, there's a, there's a process running in tandem with the zoning, and that's the National Historic Reservation uh, preservation of the building and, and historic registration. Um, that process involves working with the State of Ohio State Historic Preservation Office, and uh, the the cha I, I indicated that the site plan had changed slightly since the um, that August community meeting. Also, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office decided they didn't want any new construction west of the west facade of the Barrett School building. They wanted that full view of the west facade. Um, there were two buildings, two eight-unit buildings uh, proposed. Those were combined into a single 12-unit building um, and, a, and, a, um, and a unit added to the Barrett School building. So there was a, a net reduction of, of three or four units with that change. Um, the, um, on your other points, um, this, this has been through um, the, the, one of the speakers that spoke tonight in, in opposition was at the Development Commission um, in December, and there were a couple others also. And there was discussion at the meeting that the points raised, um, other than their concern about density, but um, site management, who's going to mow the grass, who's going to pick up the trash, who's going who's to pick up the couches that get thrown out with, with move outs. Um, those are operational questions, and, and I, I offered at the Development Commission that we, we would be glad to meet and continue to meet, and, and we did later in December. Um, three, myself, a representative of Casto, representative of Homeport, and um, Tony Roll, Marion Village Civic Association president, attended that meeting, and three neighbors um, attended also. There was discussion of how do you handle couches? Um, is the trash uh, trash collection sufficient? Um, who do we contact if there's questions about the construction once it progresses? And all of those items are are operational questions, not not land use questions. And we look forward to continuing that dialogue. That meeting in December was left with, uh, we, we talked for probably about an hour and a half, and the Casto representative explained in great detail how Casto manages apartment complexes. Casto and Homeport are equal partners in this, and Casto will be providing the site management. Casto is uh, a, a known quantity locally that has managed many, many, many apartment complexes, so we, we know who we're dealing with, um, but both, both companies would like open communication um, on the, on the, we just said we don't know on a couple things. Like we, we don't know who the project manager is going to be for the construction yet because they're not at that point where they've designated a, a site construction manager. Um, there, there's, there's, no, there's no benefit to Casto not 
keeping the site clean, mowing the grass, picking up, picking up catches, and so on. So um, I, I, I understand and, and get your point of maintaining a dialogue, and we're, we're very, very open to doing that. Any other questions uh, for the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Pair. Appreciate it. There's no other comments or discussion. Entertain uh, and make a motion for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Hardin, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 0254-2015 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.035 R3 residential district. 3309.14 height districts, 3312.13 B driveway, 3312.25 maneuvering, 3312.273 parking setback line, 3321.05 A1 B2 vision clearance, 3332.05 area district lot width requirements, 3332.13 R3 area district requirements, 3332.18 CD basis of computing area, 3332.19 fronting, 3332.21 B building lines, 3332.25 B maximum side yards required, 3332.26 B E minimum side yard permitted, 3332.27 rear yard, 3332.33 private access and parking requirements, 3332.38 EG private garage, 3333.18 building lines, and 3333.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property Located at 345 East Deschler Avenue, 43206, to permit multi unit and single unit residential development with reduced development standards in the AR1 apartment residential and R3 residential districts. The applicant is CHP Casto Barrett School Enterprises, LLC, care of David Perry, David Perry Company, Inc., 140, 145 East Rich Street, third floor. Columbus, Ohio, 43215, and Donald Plank, attorney, Plank Law Firm, 145 East Rich Street, third floor, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. Proposed unit is multi and single unit residential development. City Department's recommendation is approval. Columbus Southside Area Commission recommended approval. Historic Resources Commission recommended approval. Any questions or comments regarding this legislation? If not, move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Arden Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 0173 2015 to rezone 5160 North High Street, 43214, being 0 0.67 plus or minus acres located on the east side of North High Street. 250 plus or minus feet north of Greencrest Drive from C4 Commercial District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Moo Moo Express Car Wash, care of David P. Perry, David Perry Company Incorporated, 145 East Rich Street, third floor, Columbus, Ohio, 43215, and Donald Plank, attorney, Plank Law Firm, 145 East Rich Street, third floor, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is an automatic car wash. The City Department's recommendation is approval. The Clintonville Area Commission recommended disapproval. Development Commission recommended approval on November 13th, 2014. First, I'd ask for staff presentation. The site is currently occupied by a used car lot zoned in the C4 commercial district. The original structure was constructed as a car wash in 1968 when they were permitted in the C4 district prior to the creation of the C5 district several years later. The structure was converted to a used car 
sales office in 1984, the requested CPD commercial plan development district will allow the reestablishment of a car wash utilizing the original structure. The site is located within the planning area of the Clintonville neighborhood plan, which recommends the following in regard to the site. Retail and or multi-development, ravine preservation, parking lots are recommended to incorporate low impact design features and preservation of uh, mature trees on the site. The CPD commits to a site plan and landscaping plan and also elevation drawings. And the text provides use restrictions and development standards addressing access, ravine and tree preservation and landscaping. The proposal includes three variances Due to the narrow configuration of the site, maneuvering for the dumpster service area is proposed within the stacking lane when the car wash is closed and um, not to provide a bypass lane. And there's one variance to the community commercial overlay requirement of a public entrance on the building's facade because uh, that's where the vehicular access is for the car wash. Staff supports the proposal, noting efforts to increase landscaping, decrease pavement to improve the stormwater infiltration, and preserve the ravine area trees. With the proposed development standards, the request is consistent with the zoning and established development patterns of the area. Therefore, staff's recommendation is for approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions uh, for staff? Uh, President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, President Ginther. Can you please elaborate on the preservation of the ravine and the trees that you mentioned in terms of what does that actually look like literally in terms of the preservation? The site plan shows an area along the north uh, property boundary that uh, is going to be untouched by this proposal. Um, it's The site is working in the confines of the already developed areas. The current C4 district does not offer any protection of that area. With this CPD district and the commitment of the site plan, that area is protected. Any other questions for staff at this point? Mr. Perry. Good evening, President Ginther and all members of council. Uh, my name is Dave Perry. I'm here as a consultant uh, on behalf of Mumu Car Wash, the applicant for this rezoning request. Um, also, uh, I'd like you to meet Mr. John Roush. Mr. Roush is the uh, managing partner of Mumu Car Wash, and uh, he'll, um, he will be able to help us with questions you may have about the car wash. Um, the building the building on the property was built as a car wash. It is 30 feet wide and 100 feet long. Um, in about 1984, the current property owner uh, bought the property and changed the use to a car sales lot and auto detailing facility, but it was built as a car wash. This site is perfect for a car wash because Mumu Car Wash will be reusing the existing building. There, there will be alterations to it, but, but we'll be reusing the footprint of the existing building. And, and because the parcel is 70 feet wide by 400 feet deep, that is, that is untenable for other forms of retail development. It would be very unusual to have other forms of retail development that deep on the parcel with only 70 feet of frontage. And given that a driveway cut would take um, 20, 26 or 28 feet of that frontage. The site is located at, um, at the intersection of North High Street and Fenway Road. That intersection is presently a three-way signal, north and southbound High Street and, and Fenway Road. As part of this proposal, Mumu Car Wash is signalizing the fourth leg of that intersection to provide signalized access to the site. Um, the, the rezoning request is specifically conditioned, as, as staff indicated, but I'll, but I'll reiterate. Uh, specifically conditioned on the car wash site plan, the car wash landscaping plan, and the car wash building elevations. In, in the ordinance, what you see for the, for the car wash is exactly and only what can be built, what can be, what the property can be used for with reusing the existing building. The, the site is, 
is unusual in that um, there are many locations in Clintonville, even along the High Street arterial commercial corridor, that would be much closer to residential uses than this site. Um, the, there are apartments to the east of this site. The closest building is over 400 feet. Uh, the Wesley Glen uh, facility is to the west of this site across High Street. And depending on where you measure on the Wesley Glen building, um, Wesley Glen is 400 to 600 feet from this site. This, this site has huge separation from, from residential uses. Um, there, there's been some discussion about um, driveway access and, and vehicles. All the vehicles that are gonna go, going to go in this car wash are already there. They're already in the neighborhood. They're on High Street. They're, they're at the homes in the area. Um, and that's, that's where a car wash draw, draws from. Um, nobody, nobody's gonna drive from Hilliard to this location, and nobody's gonna drive from, from Grove City to this location. That's just, that's not how these car washes function. They, they are a neighborhood use. The Clintonville, Clintonville neighborhood plan recommends retail commercial uses. This is a retail use. The definition of retail is the provision of products and services to the end user. This is a, this is a retail service. Um, the, the staff recommends approval of the application. We've worked extensively with the Division of Traffic Management on the signal. Um, the Development Commission voted unanimously to approve this application. The Clintonville Area Commission Zoning Committee voted to approve this application. And we have a tie vote, 332 of the Area Commission. Um, there's been some suggestion about if someone voted differently and so on, um, and, and a commissioner was absent uh, who spoke at the Development Commission that said if she had been able to be at that meeting, she would have voted for it. At the end of the day, I don't, I don't know that that matters because maybe it would have been a 4-4 vote rather than a 3-3 vote. But what that tells me is that there is not widespread opposition to this application. The, as many commissioners like it as didn't like it. And um, I, I understand there's some opposition speakers here tonight. Uh, and I will, I will look forward to responding to their points and your questions. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant at this point? Okay. Our first uh, speaker in support of this is Joshua Preston. Mr. Preston. You'd make your way to the podium, share uh, your name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name's uh, Joshua Preston. I'm a resident at 122 Westview Ave. Um, when I had first heard about the Moo Moo moving in, I literally had just talked to my wife and we got really excited because we're finally gonna have a car wash near our house. Um, so we went to a few of the uh, meetings that were in our community and uh, I heard a lot of the concerns that they had, most of which I think were uh, in reaction to other construction endeavors that were currently en route, primarily a raising canes that was uh, about three to 400 feet up on High Street across from Graceland. Um, there are any number of good reasons why uh, we, we welcome this into our community, um, most of which is we need some revitalization in our, in our streets. Um, a lot of the businesses are, you know, they're, they're getting run down. The, the plan, as I've seen it, I mean, it, it one, takes an already uh, paved lot and improves it by adding some green space and some water retention, as well as fixing some of the, uh, the sidewalk issues. Um, the site is very close to the School for the Blind, and while they do have their own uh, transportation, they do, as well as myself being very close nearby, have to walk on the sidewalk, which is currently in all states of disrepair. Um, that said, I do have a couple other points. Some of the things that people had brought up, um, the traffic patterns, um, the traffic pa as it stands, personally, I don't really see a problem with the patterns. Uh, there is, it is a high traffic area just because there's a lot of traffic coming in and out. However, there's already traffic problems that could only be improved with the addition of a traffic light. Um, a lot of the traffic exiting uh, from other businesses nearby would only have the benefit from that as well. Um, the pedestrian foot, foot traffic, um, currently there's no, nothing across their driveway that's really pedestrian friendly. So when you're walking across it, it's kind of just a rundown sidewalk that is crumbling apart, like literally crumbling apart. Um, all of the designs and everything that they've put forward have improved that to look 
a lot more respectable to the other areas uh, in Clintonville as well as Worthington. Um, we are kind of in between, and it is kind of a, a high traffic area. Um, I know several other people that would like to see it there as well. Um, there was also some talk about some damage to the ravine and some tree removal. Um, I've walked the site a couple, three times, and the largest tree that maybe might have to be removed was about six to eight inches you know, in diameter, which is a relatively small tree. Um, nowhere in comparison to some of the other trees that were removed for some of the other projects. Um, that said, uh, for the zoning, um, it was obviously a car wash, and it looks like that is absolutely the best use for it. So I, as well as my wife, look forward to welcoming this to our community, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Preston. Any uh, questions uh, for Mr. Preston? President Pro Tem Mills. Mr. Preston, can you tell me in terms of your proximity to the site, please, where you live as a resident? Um, I live on Westview Avenue. Uh, my house is approximately one third of a mile as the crow flies. A third of a mile as the crow flies, is yes. that what you said? A straight line, yes. Yeah. So if I walk to the end of my street and I look across, I see uh, currently it's Stan Bradham Used Car Company. So I would be able to see this from you know, the front of my street. So okay, uh, about a third of a mile. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Preston? Other than Cleveland translations. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Elizabeth uh, Weatherholt. Commissioner, welcome uh, back to the podium. If you share your name, address, any uh, organizations you represent, ma'am, you have three minutes. Um, I, I'm Libby Weatherhold. I live at 541 East North Broadway, and I'm uh, a, as Clintonville Area Commissioner. I'm one of the com commissioners that voted in favor of this. The applicant has worked very hard at meeting all of the um, criteria and demands that Clintonville Area Commission is well known for demanding, and um, I think that it is an appropriate use of it. I, uh, in uh, trying to decide whether or not to vote for this, I um, went over to the Grandview Moo Car Wash and um, sat with my windows open and um, my favorite radio program on, and um, I had absolutely no problem listening to my radio program, um, but never had to touch the volume button. Um, uh, the, the most annoying thing was some sort of a whoop, whoop, whoop that uh, happens, I think, when it turns back on or something. But um, uh, there are apartments close to that Grandview um, car wash that, you know, look out on that, and uh, apparently they're uh, rather well um, uh, occupied. And so I think that um, for the most part, except for the barn exterior that I'm not crazy about, but I've already told the applicant, everything else um, is an appropriate use of the site. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Any uh, questions or comments from Ms. Weatherholt? And then our uh, uh, final speaker in support is, uh, I have two speakers, and I'm not sure, looks like both of them are representing um, Moo Moo Car Wash. Mr. Roush or Mr. DeSabado? So I'm, I'm thinking, Mr. Roush, you're waving your ability to speak in support of this. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Sabato, if you'd share your... Uh, Name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you have three minutes. Good evening, Council, President Ginther. Uh, John DeSabato, I live at 291 Fallis Road in Clintonville. Uh, lived in Clintonville for 30, almost 30 years. Uh, my arguments in favor of the Muma Car Wars are as follows. Um, a lot of people have already um, said some of the uh, same things I want to bring up. But High Street's a commercial corridor. Uh, new businesses will fit right in. Um, the Muma is not being built in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Uh, the concerns about noise should not be an issue. Uh, it's not near any residential homes, and the businesses close at about 8 o'clock every night. Uh, the site, again, was used for a car wash years ago. 
and the zoning committee recently approved the request for the Moomoo to be built on the site. Uh, the property is a very long and narrow piece of land. Uh, other uses may not be conductive to this size and layout of the parcel. Um, if the Moomoo is not approved, the land may become another vacant property. Clintonville has too many undeveloped properties and vacant lots along North High Street. The company is a well-run business and he's willing to invest over a million dollars to improve the property. We also uh, discussed about the traffic light being upgraded at the corner of Fenway and High. So people leaving and, and heading south on High Street can go through the light. Uh, the concerns about pedestrian traffic being affected are not reasonable. There's, always, there's already dozens of businesses on High Street. This would bring no more traffic than what, our, than what is already at High Street. The people that will be using the car wash most likely will already be traveling on High Street, so an increase of traffic is not likely unless um, you're, not, you know, you're not traveling on High Street. Uh, an improvement to the site should be welcomed by our community, not looked upon as a negative addition. I hope the committee approves the request. A new business represents positive growth for, growth for Clintonville and an asset to the North High Street quarter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeSapido. Any uh, questions for Mr. DeSapido? Thank you, sir, for coming down tonight and sharing your, your thoughts on this. Next, we have uh, three speakers who are opposed. Um, first speaker is Mike McLaughlin. Mr. McLaughlin, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to the podium and share your name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you have three minutes. Sure. My name is Mike McLaughlin. I live at 296 Crestview Road, uh, 43202. Um, <clears throat> what I'm hearing a lot uh, from the speakers is that, well, it was a car wash once before, so that's the best use for it. And it just makes me think that if we keep doing things that we did 40 years ago, because it was done 40 years ago, that's why we should do it today. I think we need to look forwards and not backwards. And so what I want to talk to a little bit about tonight is about fit and uh, how this uh, redevelopment of this lot would fit in with the existing uh, businesses that are already there that happen to be CCO compliant, which means they're set back so far from the street they have the glass fronts, they have the doors, the entrances in the front, and where uh, the applicant is asking council to approve uh, a redevelopment of this lot that is not uh, CCO compliant and will uh, effectively diminish the attractiveness of what it could be if the right project came to that lot. And so I guess what I'm getting to is that um, <clears throat> This is not the right project for the lot. If we look at uh, the history of uh, using CPDs to bring in C5 businesses onto C4 lots, there are some success stories. You look at the Giant Eagle uh, Gitco gas station in South Clintonville. Uh, it was a C5 business. It was a CPD brought onto a C4 lot, but it was also UCO compliant. And so it met the standards and it was a good fit. There was actually a, uh, a, uh, a, a request that uh, the applicant did not go forward with for a car wash on the now vacant White Castle lot just north of Patrick Jays in South Clintonville. And again, that one was UCO compliant. So in terms of fit, it was a much better thing for that lot and for the neighborhood and for the community. You even look at the uh, uh, questions that the uh, Department of Development gave us in our uh, neighborhood plan to ask ourselves whether uh, variance requests are good or bad, uh, just to make us think about it. The first one is, is the, proposed consists, is the proposal consistent with the land, with the, uh, land use plan? It isn't. Is the proposal consistent with the urban design plan? It isn't. Is the building located parallel to the street in which it fronts? It isn't. And so you can go down through this and look at all of this, and it just doesn't cut the mustard for this project. And again, 
I want to move Clinville forward. I know where it was in the back or, or where it was many years ago. You looked up and down High Street, there was inconsistency all over the place. But that's why we have zoning and that's why we have zoning laws to move us forward to the place that we want to be. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for uh, uh, coming down tonight and sharing your thoughts on this proposal. Any questions or comments for Mr. McLaughlin? Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, President Pro Tem Mills? Okay. Okay. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Richard Fowler. Mr. Fowler, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to the podium, share your name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you have three minutes. My name is Richard Fowler. I live at 57 Westview Avenue, and I represent myself and other like-minded uh, neighbors. Um, many years ago, I worked with City and a bunch of my other neighbors, and I believe maybe even Mr. Bradham on the CCO. Uh, establishing that these standards um, it was a long and hard process but the community came together and we did it as proposed the the car wash does not comply with the overlay uh, you hear about reusing the building you're not going to reuse 40 year old foundation not going to reuse 40 year old plumbing you're not going to use reuse 48 or 40 year old building it will be a new new design um, there's no sidewalk set back. Uh, it, it does increase from the current use traffic across the sidewalk, which affects walkability. Uh, let's see, to my knowledge, no traffic study has been done. I heard somebody say that using the traffic light will improve traffic flow, but stopping traffic on High Street will not, influence, will not improve the existing traffic flow. Uh, we've all been to these car washes. We've seen at times they do back out onto the main strip. High Street is currently very busy, if, and there's only about 50 feet between uh, the driveway for the Moo Moo car wash and Taco Bell, which, by the way, is their adjoining neighbor with every bit as deep a lot, and they're fully compliant. The, the backup from the Moo Moo car wash will close off the entrance and exit to Taco Bell a little more. We'll close off one of the entrance and exits to uh, Arby's. In this area, there are a number of large traffic sources, such as Wesley Glen Coda School for the Blind, Worthington Christian Elementary School. Uh, there's no, no, again, no study on how this will affect traffic. Uh, the environment, either way, you, whether you grade it to the front, grade it to the rear, any water that comes out of the building, any water that drains off the cars is going to the ravine. You cannot send that water uh, to the uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, they are proposing to cut a number of large trees in the area, ones that lean over the, the building and uh, not just small ones. It's an intense development on the banks of the ravine. Uh, there's too much pavement and not enough green space to keep the storm water on site. Some of it's gonna leave. Uh, cars and trucks dump uh, wash water, soap, uh, wax onto High Street, onto the sidewalk. When they come out, I saw this at one of their other um, car washes. Again, it's a C5 and a C4 area. It's too intense a use for that small piece of property. The area is developing. We've seen Taco Bell come in. We've seen Raising Canes uh, come in. A number of other businesses are developing in the area. Uh, again, nothing in this building will be re reused. It'll be pretty much a uh, completely new rebuild. The only, <coughs> only thing that'll be recycled is the address. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fowler. Any uh, questions for Mr. Fowler, President Pro Tem Mills? Thank you, President Gister. Ms. Ms. Thank you, President Ginther. Mr. Fowler, tell me a little bit about the traffic changes or things that may have occurred with the two businesses you just mentioned, and how that traffic has adjusted with the two, the Taco Bell being new, and you refer to the Canes being new. The the traffic. Um, I have not noticed a lot of traffic increase with the Taco Bell. It's a, a cyclical thing, mostly at lunchtime. 
sometimes in the evenings. Uh, it's a lot of walk-up traffic as opposed to vehicular traffic uses that uh, facility both from the schools and from the Broadmeadows area and the adjoining <coughs> neighborhoods as well. Uh, could you repeat your question? I forgot the second part. It, you answered it in regards to Taco Bell, but as it relates to the Raising Canes, which I think is probably more recent one in terms of the traffic. Uh, it probably will increase the traffic slightly. Again, it's, it's the same type of business as Taco Bell is. It has not opened yet, so any effects of traffic are uh, as yet unknown. But they, both of those do not have a traffic light, which will actually stop and back up high street traffic. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Fowler? Thank you, sir, for you. coming down this evening. I appreciate it. Our uh, final speaker is uh, D. Searcy, Commissioner D. Searcy. Commissioner, if you could uh, share your name, address, any organizations you represent. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President Ginther, fellow uh, members of council. Uh, I am D. Searcy. I represent District 9, which is where this uh, particular proposal would be located. Uh, with due respect, I would like to point out that in the code, it says that it is a commercial plan development district. This is a single lot, and I think that that should be remembered in the sense that this is really spot zoning to allow a single parcel to be changed from a C4 to a C5. And when we say district in the uh, code, I think of that as being a bigger area. I would also like to start by also agreeing with our folks that have previously spoken against this. This does not comply with the Clintonville Neighborhood Plan or the Clintonville Commercial Overlay or the Community Commercial Overlay that we helped develop. Repeatedly, we're reminded that these are guidelines. And I would suggest that council carefully consider before disregarding these guidelines. These were developed by the community and it's the community's vision. And <clears throat> I would also ask that you look at when is it worth disregarding this vision and the community's faith in these documents. The Moomoo car wash owner has said that it is not uncommon for him to do 60 to 100 cars per hour. This number was verified by members of our community that went on this past fall on a Monday afternoon and with a stopwatch, they were able to clock 15 to 17 cars exiting every 15 minutes. <clears throat> While this might not sound like a lot, it is given the parcel's location, the smallness of the lot, and the parcel's offset to Fenway. The exit from this car wash does not align with Fenway. It is offset. So then you have the issue of these cars not knowing exactly where they're supposed to move and when they're not. Um, we believe that it will also increase additional stacking out on High Street. And this also impedes, will impede, we believe, the access and egress of the adjoining businesses. This does not enhance walkability with a number of cars crossing the sidewalk in uh, the amount of time that they said that they can process. This is a large and typically, uh, this area has large and typically larger use than normal of by the blind and by the elderly. It is not uncommon to see the elderly and the blind carrying shopping bags or pulling their cart uh, along from our newly <coughs> renovated, shall we call it that, of um, Graceland. It's also a major bicycle route that connects Morse Road and the part of High Street that is south of this to the Broad Meadows Bridge, uh, which is the, and again, we have a high concentration of traffic cars and bikes that I, we don't believe is a good thing. The one thing they can't change about this parcel is it's small. It's very small. They're shoehorning their operation onto a 70 foot wide lot. Uh, <clears throat> they have modified their typical plan to actually put their vacuums to the side rather than their usual plan of put to the side of the building rather than moving them closer to the street as they have in this particular one. Uh, the other thing we have a concern about is the precedent. In the last 10 years, our community, District <coughs> has dealt, I'll quickly finish up, was dealt, has dealt with five requests to move from rezoning from a C4 to a C5. That's one every two years. There is no other district in Clintonville that has had to undergo the stress of having the uh, 
different developers come in and want to move from a C4 to a C5. So with that, we would certainly um, ask that you deny this request. Questions? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Searcy. Any uh, questions for Commissioner Searcy? Okay, thank you. Councilmember Tyson? Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner, I have a question. Back. So you just mentioned you've had a number of um, C5 requests. My question is, have any other car washes been, um, have come to the commission to be asked to be in this, in this space? Um, in the past 10 years, this is the third car wash, and we've had two other gas stations come to us. Uh, some of them have been in various states of that they either have not gone fully to the commission. Um, this has been the one that's actually gone the furthest in the process. But like I said, we feel that uh, we should not, our area should not be sort of the, the C5 use for the rest of Clintonville. Uh, we do have passionate people in our area and we are really concerned that that not become the precedent. And quite frankly, we don't know how you can approve this one and then deny it to someone else that comes along and asks for the same consideration. Okay. And those other car washers didn't get all the way through the process? They just, no. They got, no. okay. And just may I, if I may say, uh, just before Christmas, I had another person, another uh, attorney that was representing another gas station that wanted to know if our community would be supportive of adding yet another C5 use, which is another gas station. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank, uh, President Pro Tem Mills. Where did they end in the process? Just you know, to answer further what Councilmember Tyson was asking, where did they end in the process? When you say they haven't gotten this far, where did they end in the process? Well, some of them got as far as community meetings, and they realized that the community was not uh, receptive to that kind of use. Uh, when we had the Turkey Hill, they decided to relocate somewhere else. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't remember each specific one, but I do know that it is not uncommon for us to have these requests. And part of that is simply based upon our location. Because while we are in Clintonville, even though a lot of people say, oh, that's Clintonville, we are part of Clintonville as represented by the commission. But a lot of people look at it as that we are the gateway into Worthington. And so it's not necessarily that they're really looking to possibly service Clintonville, but they're also looking to draw the Worthington residents down, just given the location of our place in the world. So these were voted down. I just want to make sure I understood that in the yes. process. Okay, thank you. They didn't all, like I said, they didn't all get to this level, actually coming before city council. But along the way, yes. Anything Any else? other uh, questions for Commissioner Searcy? Okay, thank, thank you, you. Commissioner. I'm not going to make this uh, same mistake twice. I think Commissioner Bagwell uh, who chairs the zoning committee for the commission is here. Um, Commissioner Bagwell, do you want to make any comments regarding this? Good evening. I was not planning on speaking, so I'm not sworn. Would you, would you like to speak? I can, sure. Okay. Let me make sure we're official here. Please <laughs> raise your uh, right hand. Um, ask that anyone here who wishes to speak either for or against any council variants, including staff, raise your right hand and be sworn in. I wish to tell the whole, to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. All right. Commissioner Bagwell. Thank you. I'm Dana Bagwell. I am the Chair of Zoning and Variance Committee and Vice Chair of the Commission. I live at 3982 North High Street, Columbus, 43214. Um, basically, to echo both sides of this, um, the Zoning and Variance Committee voted almost unanimously in favor of this. There were two opposing voices. Uh, the commission did end in a tie with one uh, commissioner who wasn't present who would have voted in favor had she been present. The arguments against it, um, as you've heard, were C5 use in a C4 location, um, not conforming to the neighborhood plan, and not conforming to the overlay. The arguments in favor, as you've already heard, have been um, that area needs the development, 
It is a respected business in the community. Um, I believe Mr. Rausch's track record with all, with all of his businesses is that they open and they have never closed. Um, he does not have any issues in the neighborhoods where he currently operates, to my knowledge. And um, he's willing to invest over a million dollars in this property and make the traffic light a four-way signal. I think that covers it. I'm willing to answer any questions if you have anything for me. Thank you, Commissioner Bagwell. Any questions for Commissioner Bagwell? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ask uh, the applicant if uh, you'd like to offer a rebuttal. Certainly, on, um, on several points, Clintonville goes from uh, approximately Arcadia to the Worthington Municipal Line, and there are dozens and dozens of public streets that intersect High Street, and very few of them are signalized. And in addition to those dozens and dozens of public streets, there are um, many, many, many more I, I can't tell you exactly how many driveway cuts that access High Street. And the way that vehicles leave those unsignalized streets to access High Street, leave those driveways, is waiting for a break in the traffic and hoping they've guessed it right. As opposed to, as opposed to signalized street intersections that wait in an organized, coordinated manner for the lights to change appropriately, as will be the case at this site. This is not, this is not a new signal. There, there doesn't need to be a traffic study of installing a signal here, as, as one speaker suggested. It is, it is an existing signal that a signal leg is being added to to control access to the driveway of the proposed car wash. The driveway access will be signalized and timed the same as the Fenway access. There's no additional phasing of the signal. And in terms of, in terms of backing up traffic, whatever backs up is due to the signal that's already there. Um, this, this driveway functions with whatever the, the signal timing is for the Fenway, Fenway Road use of that signal. On environmental issues, there is, we, we cannot discharge into the ravine. That has been suggested. We cannot discharge into the ravine. This is in an area with separated sanitary and stormwater. Um, this ordinance, this site plan that MUMU is committing to provides greater protection of the ravine than exists now by setting aside a no disturb area. There, there is language in the, um, there, there are two areas identified on the site plan. One is a no disturb area and then, and then there's a smaller area immediately adjacent to the building where there are where there are trees overhanging the building and we have been totally upfront about the need to trim them. The site was checked in conformance with the site plan to see exactly what trees would need to be removed. And I'm going from memory, it's also on the site plan, but there's one dead ash tree um, and a couple scrub trees that are identified on the site plan that have to be moved for the site, removed for the site development. This, this project increases the protection of the ravine. The site is, um, has a very high amount of pavement now, impervious surface. That pavement is being reduced. Uh, before even filing the zoning application, Mr. Roush and I walked the site with public utility staff, stormwater staff, to discuss here's, what's, here's what exists, what do we need to do to comply with the city city ordinance, city requirements on stormwater. We were, we were way ahead of this issue to know what the requirements would be and, and aware of the ravine issue. But let me repeat, Mumu Car Wash cannot discharge into the ravine. And, and this provides greater protection of the ravine. Um, on pedestrian safety, let me go back to the countless number of driveways that intersect High Street and unsignalized streets versus a signalized intersection. Um, I, I think it's intuitive about what, what is a greater level of safety at a signalized intersection than with unsignalized flow of vehicles and drivers rushing out of driveways to get ahead of the oncoming traffic. 
I, I think that's intuitive relative to pedestrian safety. Um, this property, this property is entitled to a driveway cut. Um, there are, th this is not, this is not introducing a new sidewalk crossing. It's not introducing um, new interference with pedestrian movement, if you want to call it that. Um, we've, we talked, the speakers talked about not being CCO compliant. It, it's not subject to being CCO compliant because it's, because it's remodeling an existing building. To say that, to say that every property owner that has an existing building is subject to the CCO retroactively is, is a very significant property right issue. And so this, there are, there are two minor variances. There, there's, one section, there's one section of the CCO that applies, and that is the building appearance section. And there are two minor variances to that. We don't, we don't quite meet the glass, the percentage of glass on the west facade of the elevation facing High Street, but keep in mind that that building is, is a long distance from High Street. Um, on the, um, let's see, there's been some discussion of um, stacking onto High Street. Um, if, if council members have operational questions on that, um, I, I'd like to ask Mr. Roush to, to tell you how the, the operational aspects of the um, of the car wash, but um, we are sensitive to that and um, are are prepared to commit to you as an amendment that that a uh, off-duty police officer will be provided as needed for those overflow times. Um, the operational aspect of um, of Mumu when when there is a backup is that an employee would be would would wave traffic on or indicate to not not enter the driveway cut of whatever the location is. Um, but if it's, if it's um, desirable of the council to have that done by an off-duty police officer, we will do that also. Thank you. Any other questions uh, uh, for the applicant? Council Member Paley. Uh, when I met with you and when I met with um, the people that were opposed to the zoning, one of my biggest concerns was um, water going into the system. And it was explained to me, and I have to say that um, my blueprint department, my Department of Utilities did extensive research with regards to the discharge, discharge of water with regards to this business. And I need you to correct me if I'm wrong, because you did not say this. And I want it on record if this is true or not. This is a self-contained unit that reuses the water and no water is discharged, or very little water is discharged. At least it's um, not significant enough to create a problem that we believe in, is in the environment, and that was checked out by the Department of Utilities and our stormwater people and the blueprint people and everybody else that was emailing me over the weekend because of my concerns. I also understand that that cannot be made an amendment in the zoning um, application. However, it is part of your site plan and therefore has to be complied with. So that was my research. Is that true? Uh, that is absolutely true. I'm sorry for my oversight in not talking about how the water is handled. Um, Councilwoman Paley, would you like Mr. Roush to describe that system? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, thank you for seeing me tonight. Uh, to, we, we have eight other locations in, in town and we started the business, one of our key things is efficiency and part of efficiency is using our water properly. We recycle all of our water and we do add about 20 gallons of fresh water per car wash to the process, but we collect all this water, we run it through our, in our, our, our treatment system treat it, filter it, uh, and then we reuse it for the bulk of our wash. There's a, there is a very minimal drive off uh, residue off the cars. Uh, most of that's spot free water that comes, it's our last process when you get your car washed. The Moo Moo, you get a spot free rinse, sales point. Uh, so that's typically what's kind of left over when, when, it's, when the vehicles are leaving the tunnel. But 
we've, we're, we're next to creeks, other, we've got a site on, uh, in Upper Arlington that is next to a stream and we've never had any environmental issues company-wide with anything at all. Uh, we treat all of our waste, all of our uh, tanks, our oil interceptors are professionally maintained by EPA certified haulers. Uh, we clean our pits out uh, with those same companies. It's all documented. Um, and again, we've never had any issues anywhere ever. So the water filtration program is in your site plan? It's part of the building, but it's, it's, it's what we do. We, I think we, we use a, a company in California that builds this machine and in the underground tankage that stores its water and it cycles through it. I, I, we can, I'm glad, I'll be happy to put that in this legislation that we will use the same system in this site. President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, President Kennedy. I just have a couple operational questions. Can you share one of the concerns that was raised, and, and I want to thank Council Member Paley for addressing environmental issues, and I have one last one in terms of the size of the protections to the ravine and, and, and give some more detail related to that. But operational questions that I have are what would you consider your peak hours of performance and what does that mean in terms of cars and traffic? Because that is one concern that I heard from the residents and also the blocking of the sidewalk and interrupting walkability of that area. And my other questions, President Ginther, would be for staff. Well, we, we obviously, we're on a, a great day. It's sunny, the roads, we just got hit with salt trucks, so we're, we're busy. Um, typically, our stores wash around 350 to 400 cars per day that we're discharging on average you know, uh, less than a car every two minutes. That light there at Fenway changes about every minute and a half, naturally, just from across the street. So, not to mention we have stackability when the cars exit the car wash, we have a fluff. People typically vacuum or go in and, you know, prep their cars out. Uh, but even if you exit the tunnel, it's a minute and a half. So half the time that you can speak here, that's one car. That's as fast as the machine is going. The nice thing about a conveyorized car wash is that we're, we're putting cars in, into the traffic exactly steady. Whereas like a drive-through, Taco Bell next door, big order gets slowed down, gets backed up, two small orders, and you can, you can see where that would log jam coming out. We, we, we have, obviously, when we're extremely busy, uh, it's not the time to look at our business. If you look at our business 364 days of the year when it's our normal operations, we're very quiet, we're very controlled, we're a very uh, traffic uh, controlled situation. Um, again, we've, not, we've never had any zoning uh, or uh, police uh, incidences in, at any of our sites. We've never blocked any streets off and caused any accidents. Um, we have very similar sites to this. Our Upper Arlington site, I would say, is very similar to this, where, where you stack, you know, right there to Henderson Road. Uh, you know, and again, we've just never had any issues with it. Uh, this site stacks a ton of cars. I think, what do we, did we count? 25. 25 to the pay stations and then another f six into the tunnel. So typically our customers, if they see the line coming out to the street, they're not going to wait. It looks too much. And, and uh, it just really, we've never had a problem with it. Uh, so, if we do, on our busy days, we staff extra heavy to help control the parking lot, keep the parking lot clean, the vacuums clean, and control traffic. Uh, and, and we're committed again to, if we need to, on busy days, and we can forecast, we see when our days are going to be busy, we watch the weather very closely, um, we know the condition of the vehicles, uh, and we've got some good hi history watching this, we will put an off-duty police officer to help us maintain this traffic. So we're committed to that. Thank you, uh, Council Member Harden. Thank you, President Ginther. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my concern, I think, centered around, I think we're hearing the, the backup that you, you spoke to. And, um, and so I, hearing that you would potentially pull out a, a special duty officer, to me, helps alleviate some of those concerns. Uh, Council Member Page and I had the opportunity to come out to the site this weekend. And what you will realize is that it, it really is a very small, um, narrow uh, uh, site. And so um, 
I think that there are some valid concerns about potential backup just in, in, in the, the, the how small of an area we're dealing with. Uh, to that point, have, if there would ever be a backup, it would really affect that Taco Bell and the RB, Arby's that are, are close by. Have they been involved in this process? Have you talked to them? Have they been engaged? And where are they? At in the they I'm sure they've been, been um, you know, the zoning's been announced to them. We've not heard one thing, one concern with them. Um, we, we'll, we'll, we will make sure that no cars get onto High Street to back onto it. I mean, that's, we, we don't want that. If, if, if a customer got in an accident out there or clogs up High Street, it's bad for business, it's bad for our customers, uh, and, you know, bad for the community, and we just, we, we don't want it. We're not going to let it happen. We're going to make sure, we're going to be diligent about this site in particular because of its concern. Uh, but again, customers kind of, when they see the car sitting out there, they just don't stop. I mean, it, they don't sit out there and queue out there on the street. So I think the customer's going to do probably 90% of it, and the other 10% will get them shooed off and make sure that we can control that area over there. But this site being 400 feet deep is actually very helpful because they stack all the way around and stack. We, we, all, we, we stack all the way to the very eastern property line and then back to the tunnel. So it's it's, it's a little deceptive of how it flows, but it's a nice left turn. It's an easy site to maneuver. Um, I, but I think we're going to be, and I think we're going to be able to control the concern for sure. Any other questions? Councilmember Bailey. I'm a little bit confused because I've looked at this extensively, and the traffic issue is. And this, maybe this is for staff. I, I'm not sure. If there's a traffic light at the intersection where that is, you can't stack up back there. You can't sit on a green, can you? I mean, that doesn't even make sense to me. I mean, I can understand if you're in the middle of an intersection and you could just kind of back up. But if you're, I mean, if you're in the middle of a street, but I don't understand how you would back up on a street with a light at the intersection. And I'm assuming that's why the light's there. I'm sorry, <clears throat> sorry, Councilwoman. Are you asking about the entering traffic or the exiting traffic? Coming, the, coming in? Okay. Uh, well, the, the vehicles that are stacking, that begins at the rear of the site. So there's, there's 25, is there space for at least 25 cars to... No, I'm not talking about stacking into the property. I I'm, I'm believe that the residents are concerned that they're going to stack up on High Street. And I've seen, I've actually gone and looked at them, and the ones that I've seen don't have lights at them, and so they do back up. Like, I live by one on Broad Street, and it does back up, but it does and kind of in back of it because there's access to a road without a light. But if there's a light here, how can they sit at a green light and just be sitting there because there's a light there at the entrance. Am I correct or am I seeing this wrong? Uh, correct. There is a traffic signal at the access point. There will be. There is a traffic light today. And, and However, this, this site greatly exceeds the, the code requirement. Um, and having seen several other plans of these uh, sites developed, um, as far as from our department's perspective, uh, we're confident that this would be uh, sufficient space to handle even the, the heavy days in the spring when, when their, their volumes would be, would be heavier with the entering traffic. So um, this, this appears to be maximizing that aspect of, of the uh, potential concern. And it, I would venture to say it's probably unlikely that the uh, special duty officer would be needed even on those heavy, heavy days. Any other uh, questions, Council Member Page? Thank you, President Ginther. Um, and this is a question for staff. If the car wash doesn't comply with the site plan, is there um, any enforcement mechanism within the city that can require them to come into compliance? Um, after, if, if this ordinance is approved, uh, the site would be submitted for uh, the site compliance review process. If it is not in compliance with this CPD plan, 
uh, the, that approval would be placed on hold. Um, if the plan gets approved and at some point in time there is some non-compliance issue, it can be uh, enforced by our code enforcement or our um, building investigation team staff, depending on what the issue is. And would that also include how they are dealing with their water, like the discharge? The uh, um, stormwater and sanitary review occurs at the time of site compliance, and they won't get their permits for approval if they are in not in compliance. And then, once again, if the permits are approved and, and there is some issue reported, the public utilities staff would, would investigate that and, and request correction if necessary. Any other uh, questions? So um, two amendments we're adding. Uh, our special duty officer to help alleviate any concerns, particularly with the elderly uh, and uh, uh, blind, coming from School for Blind, uh, pedestrian traffic on high uh, traffic, heavy traffic days. And the other piece was around the water treatment um, system to make sure that that's uh, part of the text as well. So we need those amendments this evening before the applicants leave. To um, make sure President that Ginther, may I interject? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the zoning staff had a problem with that particular part of the amendment, the, uh, the equipment, because it's not a zoning issue. We're, we're not sure how our code enforcement would enforce that. And uh, Chris Prezudi, the chief zoning official, we had reviewed a possible amendment to this regard, and we were not comfortable with that being in the zoning ordinance. We, we felt confident that the public utilities staff, when they review the site compliance plan and the stormwater plans would be able to address that better. Councilmember Paley, are you uh, okay with that approach? I, uh, I, when I talked to Mr. Perry over the weekend and he put together the amendment for me because of my concern with regards to the water issues, thank you, Mr. Perry. Um, I was then informed by that it was inappropriate place to put the amendment and uh, had a conversation with Councilmember Page who had a little bit more experience in that particular area and informed me that if there was a violation in the actual site plan application that they could deal with it that way. I'm comfortable with that. So I think the only additional amendment then would be with uh special uh, duty officers to help with, with traffic flow. Mr. Perry, anything um, else you'd like to add? Uh, yes, just one thing. Um, the, the zoning staff responded today that they uh, would prefer to not have that amendment. Um, uh, I, I've discussed the project at length with the public utilities, uh, uh, storm and sanitary staff. Um, and even though it will not be part of the ordinance, uh, we are on record that there is a water, there will be a water reclamation system in the tunnel, and um, Mr. Roush's system recycles approximately 75% of the water of each wash. That will be demonstrated on, um, it, it's not really a site plan requirement since it's, since it's underground, but, it'll, but other, other permit processes need to be followed with this application, one of which will be stormwater plans and sanitary plans, and that equipment will be demonstrated on those submittals. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. So I'd like to move uh, another question. President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, President Ganther. I just want to confirm that there's tree trimming and not tree cutting down. That was one other piece that I wanted to make sure we cleared up. And then I wanted staff to talk about in regards to the precedent of rezoning. Those are my last two. We have identified on the site plan there are a few trees that we need to remove, uh, maybe I think it's three, three uh, and then some trimming. Um, there's a lot of dead ash and some scrub brush that, that, that's around the site that we're even going to leave. But we, whatever we've identified in the plan, we're gonna, we, we will stand by that for sure. Um, I think uh, what you're trying to ask is what, what precedent will the CPD district establish here? Um, first, I'd like to explain that um, 
There are a lot of fast food establishments along North High Street. Those are C5 uses too. They're allowed in C5 districts. They just happen to be allowed in C4 because they have some seating, but those uses predominantly are drive through not a whole lot of people are um, dining in uh, to those establishments. So just, just so uh, there already are some C5 uses in this corridor. Um, the community commercial overlay does not prohibit C5 uses. If you look at it, 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 it mentions nothing about the prohibition of uses. It just has development standards. And for this site, because the building is staying, the overlay requirements do not kick in except for the facade changes that they are making. Um, staff didn't think that it would be establishing any type of negative precedent. This is North High Street. It's, it's a, a heavily traveled commercial corridor in, in our city. And what better place to have those types of uses than uh, secondary roadways where they're not as appropriate? I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council members? If not, I uh, would move uh, to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, call the roll by voice. Harden. Yes. Klein. Mills. Yes. Page. Yes. Paley. Yes. Tyson. Yes. President Ginther. Yes, uh, amended. And now move for passage. Clerk, call the roll by voice. Harton, yes. Klein, Mills, Page, yes. Paley, yes. Tyson. No. no. President Ginther. Yes, legislation passes. Great, thank you. Is there anything else to come before uh, the zoning committee this evening? Council President, I do have one final matter. Please. Uh, I move to reconsider Ordinance 42-2015 and variance for 607 Denison Avenue, which was defeated last Monday evening, uh, and ask for a voice vote on the issue. Uh, following the vo a voice vote, assuming it's successful, I have to also move to table it indefinitely. But the first motion is to um, reconsider. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll by voice. Harden. Yes. Klein. Yes. Mills. Yes. Page. Yes. Haley. Yes. Tyson. <clears throat> yes, I am um, in support of reconsideration because I thought even last week that we probably should have tabled it indefinitely to see if there was any way that this could have been worked out with the residents. And so I was for it last week. Thank you. President Ginther. Yes, reconsider. Move to table indefinitely. Is there a second? Clerk call the roll. Harden. Yes. Klein. Yes. Mills. Yes. Page. Yes. Paley. Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Yes, tabled indefinitely. Anything else to come before zoning this evening? If not, is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Harden, Klein, Mills, Page, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. We stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>